ADR alliance. And we are talking about standard-based approaches for distributed energy resources. The webinar is an activity of the Vehicle Grid Integration Group at the Alan Turing Institute. The Turing is the national institute in the UK for data science and artificial intelligence. And one of the objectives of the Institute is to apply data science methods to help solve real world problems, such as what we are doing at the Vehicle Grid Integration Group, where we are helping the transition to decarbonized transport and power infrastructure. Another activity of the group is a cloud-based platform we are developing to support secure storage, sharing, and analysis of the data. So we are developing a tool to automate the collection and analysis of data from electric vehicles, from electric vehicle chargers, and from the electricity network. And the aim of the tool is to help network planners get insights on their network. For example, help them find the right places on the network to target for upgrades with the increase of uh, low carbon technologies, such as electric vehicles. Now back to the webinar topic, it is crucial that we coordinate low carbon te technologies and distributed energy resources to unlock their flexibility so that they can help us integrate more renewable energy and help us in the operation of the network. And today we are looking at the role of standards that help us to do this. In the second part of the webinar, we're specifically focusing on the open ADR protocol. If you wanted to know more, uh, um, and uh, this, this graph is showing an example of the EV ecosystem and the several entities involved and the complexity that could happen. So it is crucial that these several entities speak one language or at least converge to a few languages, few standards, so that we can ensure this coordination. If you wanted to know more about different uh, protocols, then check out our YouTube playlist where uh, we have uh, previous episodes talking about several communication protocols in the EV ecosystem. Today, I'm delighted to uh, host this webinar with Carbon Co-op and uh, the Open ADR Alliance. And also, I'm delighted to have speakers from um, institutions that are leading the way in the transformation of our electricity networks. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, uh, give over to Nina to tell us more about the UK PAS 1878. Meanwhile, if you have questions, please do leave them in the chat box. And uh, Ben from Carbon Co-op will take the first Q&A session. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for that introduction, Miriam. So, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ben and Miriam, for um, hosting this webinar series. I always find the talks really interesting, and I'm looking forward to the speakers that we've got later on today, the other talks. Um, but I'll start off today, then, by talking you through PAS 1878 and 1879, which cover energy smart appliances, or ESAs, and use them to deliver demand-side response, or DSR. And this is standards development that's happening in the UK, with the British Standards Institution, BSI. My name is Nina Klein. Um, I work as an energy engineer at the UK Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. So my presentation today has three parts. I'll quickly, first of all, set the scene, then give you some of the technical details of the standards, and finally th talk you through the timelines. So to start off then, I'll give you the context for this standards development work. So the question is really, why is the UK government sponsoring development of these smart standards? So standards can help to lower the cost and promote innovation in these technologies. They can be important for accelerating the uptake of safe and interoperable smart products and services. Secondly, these technical specifications can be referenced in future regulations, which is of course of interest to governments in the UK and abroad. And finally, a key objective is to demonstrate UK leadership by promoting these published standards for international adoption. So what is the approach we're taking to these standards, particularly in terms of their scope? So the appliances cover five B 
These standards cover five key appliance types. So HVAC, heating, ventilation and air conditioning equipment, cold and wet appliances, although dryers, tumble dryers are still in scope, despite being neither cold nor wet. Um, they also cover battery storage and also electric vehicle smart charge points. These are appliances most suitable for domestic DSR. The standards are also underpinned by four key principles, which I'll talk you through. The first one is interoperability. That's about the ability of an ESA to work seamlessly across any DSR service operated by any system player. The second principle is data privacy. That's about the secure storing of data on the device or with any controlling party. The third principle is grid stability. That's about the prevention of outages on the grid caused by the erroneous operation of any ESAs. And the fourth principle is cybersecurity. And that's about preventing unauthorized access to an ESA by any third parties. Finally, in terms of scope, the PASs are compatible, but don't mandate use of the GB smart metering system. And that's because PASs are international standards documents. But this is a UK PAS, so it has compatibility. Secondly, then, in terms of the process for developing these standards, the British Standards Institution, or BSI, is leading this standards development process. And they're developing a standardized technical framework that covers both ESAs and DSR to develop an end-to-end -end system for domestic DSR across two PASs. So the first PAS is PAS 1878. That sets out a specification for ESAs. And you can remember that this is the device level PAS because the year 1878 was the year when the light bulb was first invented. The second PAS is PAS 1879. And this sets a framework for DSR operation. And you can kind of remember that this PAS is the entity level PAS because the year 1879 was the year electricity was first sold for money. So between the two of them, they can integrate together and they should provide this end-to-end -end technical framework for domestic DSR. Now, the standards development process is industry-led and there's an expert steering group that advise on the development of these standards. You can see on the right-hand side some of the organisations involved in this standards development. And it's just from a really, really wide range of sections and we've been really appreciative of all the input that people have been giving. So, produce, so to produce these PASs or publicly available specifications, it's a fast track process that's industry led, as I said. A technical author will draft the standards. They're then reviewed by the expert steering group. A public consultation also takes place before the standards are then published. And after publication, PASs can be updated at any time, but every two years, BSI will check if an update will be appropriate. Finally, then, in terms of the technical approach, a key principle here was to specify only minimum requirements for DSR meeting those four principles. And by specifying only the minimum, we allow innovation to take place on top. Now, the standards specify a DSR framework and they provide details for called response services. So, for example, real time flexibility, a DNO asking for local constraints response or a transmission system operator asking for a frequency response. However, the standards have handles for other kind of more routine DSR services to be built on top. So for example, whole house integration or how you might optimize appliances against the time of use tariff. These other aspects can be left up to the IP of companies or their international standards developing here. A key principle for the technical approach was that the framework should enable revenue streams and not restrict business models. So certain um, demand side response services like frequency response are very high value, but they also have very fast response times required. And so the technical framework needs to enable that fast response time to enable those revenues to be gained. And finally, and importantly, the standards are being developed to align with existing international standards where that's possible. And I say where that's possible because some of these international standards are under development, but we've been taking their current status and integrating with that. And I like to put up the logos for all the international standards organizations because it just fills you with confidence that they will manage to go for the same standardized blue. I think that's really nice. So on to then the second part of the presentation and it's time to get a bit more technical now. So you can either wake up or go to sleep. We're early on in the webinar, so hopefully no one's falling asleep just yet. Um, and I'll just say before I go on to these details, um, this is a draft PAS proposal. So these are proposals that are currently in draft because the PAS is under development. I'll start off, of course, with definitions. 
Um, but really what I mean is acronyms. So brace yourself for a moment and I'll talk you through. So the first one is a demand side response service provider or a DSRSP. This is an organization providing demand side energy management services. So for example, an aggregator, you might hear them called. The second acronym is Consumer Energy Manager or SEM. And this is essentially a logical entity that can be physical or virtual, and it basically deals with flexibility information. It sits in the middle and translates between the DSRSP and the ESA. And then finally, at the bottom, you have the ESA. An energy smart appliance is an internet connected device that can modulate or shift its electricity consumption in response to signals. So now uh, you know the acronyms, I'll take you through the architecture. And the first thing to say is there are two key types of DSR services. Routine DSR services are shown in light blue here on the diagram. And here, an ESA operates based on incentives that are set in advance. This will, of course, con include consumer preferences. And often incentives come from um, market signals with multiple parties taking place in that market. A good example is an ESA optimizing its operation based on a routine incentive, such as a time of use tariff, which is set by an energy supplier based on the wholesale market. A second type of DSR is response DSR. And this is when appliances operate based on requests made in real time, and it's shown in dark blue on the diagram here. Operation then includes considering consumer and taking into account and operating based on consumer preferences. And often it's required due to the bilateral contracts for firm service provision. So a good example here is grid operators requesting frequency response services, which get implemented by DSRSPs. These real-time services have those fast response periods, as I said, and therefore they're often high value services. So overall, the PAS specifies how these dark blue response requests are sent and received but how these light blue incentives are optimized against can be left to innovation. So now I'll talk you through the next bit of the architecture and its overall structure is based on international standards. There are three key interfaces shown in green. The first one is interface A, which operates between the SEM and the DSRSP. This interface will be interoperable in the PAS. It's specified so a SEM can operate with any DSRSP. The steering group is currently considering what minimum standard to specify at this interface A. Three candidates are currently being assessed. These are OpenADR, EEBUS, and DLMS COSIM. The steering group could decide to pick one as the minimum standard or all three as the minimum standard, and those discussions are ongoing. The next interface is interface B in green here between the SEM and the ESA itself. This interface in the PAS can be proprietary, which means it can be specific for different ESAs. So an EV charge point can operate using OCPP, for example. And finally, there's an interface C, which is optional for integration with the GB smart metering system. Two key points fall out from this overall architecture. Number one, an ESA must be supplied with a SEM as a minimum to allow it to be interoperable across DSRSPs, but this doesn't restrict third parties providing that SEM. And secondly, users can subscribe individual ESAs to specialist DSRSPs for a specific service. So DSRSPs can be specialists in electric vehicles or specialists in heat pumps, and consumers can get those benefits. So now you've seen the architecture, I'll explain how the operation works. A hierarchy of operation is defined based on those two modes. So the lower priority mode is routine mode, and that's essentially a baseline that can operate 24-7. The ESA is operating based on the consumer wishes and any of those external incentives like a time of use tariff it can optimize against. The next level priority is response mode, and this will override that routine baseline during any response request from the DSRSP. Now that will happen unless the consumer manually overrides that request, but their preferences have already been built into that request. During response mode, the ESA will operate according to the consumer's wishes and the DSRSP is chosen flexibility option, for example, to provide frequency response. So in practice, how this will work is a DSRSP will request flexibility from hundreds of thousands of devices. These requests will be statistically calculated with overheads because some non-response is expected, and this helps make the system more resilient. However, we of course also have cybersecurity requirements in the PAS, and these do go beyond um, IoT security as it's seen today. 
but it does employ well-established industry best practice. So apologies, there's no quantum cryptography or anything too exciting. It's all fairly boring, but it does do the job and it does go beyond a lot of what's around today. So now I'll explain the details of that flexibility offer and how the system operates. An ESA creates a power profile, which is basically a graph of power against time. And it creates this based on consumer preferences and of course also how the appliance operates and then any of those external incentives. The PAL specifies that at a minimum, three power profiles will need to be provided. The first one is the intended operation profile. And that's the profile that can run in routine mode, that light blue mode. Then the two other minimum profiles are the most delayed and the least delayed. And these two profiles essentially provide those flexibility options for use in response mode. Now that's just the minimum three. We're specifying only the minimum more could be provided, but at least these three need to be provided. And then the way the system works is that these three minimum profiles are updated whenever their status changes and sent to the DSRSP. So the DSRSP can keep a live merit order of all the flexibility possible. I'll now tie all of that together with a worked example, but it's worth noting that this is just an illustrative example. There are a number of different routes that the appliances can be controlled through. And I'll just show you the route via an internet connected stem. So the appliance starts off in routine mode as it is 24 seven, and it's regularly creating and sending those three minimum power profiles, number one, from the ESA, through the SEM up to the DSRSP. And those power profiles are updated whenever their status changes. Then during a response request, if for example, a system operator wants frequency response, a DSRSP will select one of those power profiles and the duration time it would like it to run for. And then number two, it will send that chosen flexibility option to the SEM for the ESA to implement. Now, because the DSRSP has all those profiles pre-registered, a single request can deliver that DSR response which enables very fast responses. And so ESAs can participate in those high value DSR services. The ESA is then running in response mode. And during that mode, it regularly sends its active power and any power profile updates up to the DSR SP, that's number three, from the ESA to the SEM up to the DSR SP. Now these updates get sent whenever the status changes with any of those three power profiles. And the active power can be sent depending on the technical requirements of the DSR service. That means a DSRSP can know how much power is being provided and can call more or less DSR response from its live merit order of other appliances, depending on how much is being delivered from its current call. So it can call iteratively. When the DSRSP request period ends, the appliance can go back into routine mode. And again, that might be optimizing against a routine incentive, such as a time of use tariff coming in and likely from the energy supplier. So that's how it works. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about our timelines to wrap up then. So we have the two standards, as I said, and PAS 1878 is the specification for energy smart appliances. That consultation has closed and received over 650 comments, which VSI are now going through with the steering group. And that standard is planned to be published in spring of 2021 next year. The second standard is PAS 1879, and that's the code of practice for the demand side response framework. The public consultation for this PAS is currently open until the 9th of December this year. Um, after that, those comments will, of course, be considered by the steering group and the standard will finally be published in spring, summer 2021. So please do click on the links and contribute to that public consultation if you'd like. That's all from me. So I'll say thank you for listening. Um, let me know if you'd like to be in touch with any questions. We'll try and take some today. And uh, please do go to the BSI website for any further updates about the programme. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Nina. Now over to Ben. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, Ben. And Great. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, uh, Miriam and also to Nina. Um, Carbon Carb have also been involved in the PADS process and I know it's been an enormous amount of work and I hope hopefully I can pick up some of the threads through our work in that in this presentation as well. So my name's Ben Aylott. I'm an energy systems engineer and a project manager here at Carbon Corp. 
Um, and today I'd like to tell you about our PowerShaper service, uh, which is a brand new service um, that we've built. Um, and I, I think it acts as a, an interesting case study in the application of the standards with similar standards to what we've just been hearing about in domestic DSR. So first about Carbon Corp, briefly. Um, Carbon Corp, a, a bit of a weird organization. It's a non-profit energy services and advocacy cooperative. That's what we say, uh, based in Greater Manchester, uh, city region in the UK. Um, we're, we're a membership organization and our members are uh, pr predominantly householders, um, and we have over 200 householder members. We also provide services and to a wider range of customers. Um, and um, we're a rapidly growing organization. We're now 18 members of staff, and we work across three principal areas. So uh, we started off doing um, do domestic retrofit, which um, is the extensive renovations of buildings to reduce their uh, energy use and CO2 emissions. And uh, more recently, we've also expanded into uh, what we call energy systems, but it's, it's sort of the stuff we're talking about today, the smart energy flexibility area. Um, and we also have some work in addition to this in uh, energy community engagement and policy. And we've uh, produced uh, policy documents for UK government and European Union in these sorts of areas in the past. Um, I have to say that uh, uh, the stuff I'm talking about today, it's um, uh, been funded by uh, multiple uh, innovation uh, competitions. Uh, the, the first was um, uh, the Bayes Domestic Demand Side Response Competition, uh, and that was for the Open DSR project. And um, that was funded by Bayes, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, which is where Nina works. Um, and more recently, we also uh, gained some follow on funding under Horizon 2020 um, to continue the development and demonstration of the Power Shaper system. And that project is a collaboration project called ResCoop VPP. So what is the uh, Power Shaper service? Um, uh, basically, it it's, acts as the consumer facing side uh, for our domestic flexibility and demand side response work. So it's the, it's the portal for our members and other customers uh, into accessing um, our, our flexibility demand side response services. So basically people, it's a place that people can go and sign up and there are some user applications which enable them to uh, participate in demand side response programs as well as gain access to their smart meter data. The, as a business, the uh, service, it's initially mainly was targeting the new uh, DNO flexibility schemes. And we've got some speakers later on talking about the WPD scheme, which fits into this category. Um, but we're also now increasingly looking at uh, expanding the technical capabilities of the system to support uh, things like uh, behind the meter optimization with time of use tariffs. And then our hope is going into the future that we'll also be able to plug this into um, the national flexibility markets, um, either the ones that already exist or ones that will be introduced in the future. So it's a service to enable domestic customers to participate in demand side response schemes. Um, what are some of the innovative features of PowerShaper? Um, relevant to today, it's, it's uh, an open ADR based system. Um, so open ADR is a standard that we're gonna be hearing a lot about in part two of this uh, workshop. Um, so I won't say any more about it now. Um, and the second main feature is that we, we're plugged into the UK smart metering system and we use it to uh, do all of our assurance and verification of the demand side response that uh, we are providing. So we don't need to install any additional meters or anything like this. And um, I think 
alongside the standards, it's also worth saying that we're we're quite big on uh, open source, and we we're we're really leveraging um, a lot of open source software, um, including uh, a package called Home Assistant, which is the basis of our home energy management system, which allows for the integration with a very large range of products and services out the box. Um, I won't dwell on this jumble of uh, uh, boxes and acronyms too long, but it, this depicts the uh, system architecture behind the PowerShaper service. Um, whilst Nina was speaking, I, I labeled it up with some of the terms from the uh, PaaS standards that are still in development to give you an idea of how this uh, might map onto what Nina was uh, talking about. Um, but um, I think uh, without going into too much detail, it's, it's worth noting that, you know, whilst uh, there is an extra uh, logical element here to support the um, open ADR uh, standard and protocol, it has not required the, uh, an overly complex system in order to put this in place. So we found that um, adding open ADR and using open ADR um, has provided a lot of benefits without uh, significantly increasing the complexity of how the system operates. Um, so what actually does the system do? How, how mechanically does it work? Um, uh, and it, it, it's not uh, very complicated. Um, we, we install equipment in um, people's homes, uh, these management systems. We connect these to smart appliances, such as EV chargers, um, electric heating systems, hopefully in the future, things like batteries and heat pumps. And then we periodically will schedule uh, demand side response events. And these then get notified to users uh, and the management systems, uh, at which point uh, there is the option for users to opt out. Um, if they don't opt out, um, the management system will um, then at the correct time um, turn down uh, whatever load it has available, which is connected to. And then finally, as I said before, we, we measure and verify that this has happened using the smart meter data. So uh, this is uh, something that's come out the end. Uh, a graph depicting an, a, the response we achieved in a particular event. Um, this was a particularly good event. Um, so a user was able to contribute uh, six kilowatts of flexibility here. And what's being shown in the graph uh, in, in the red, the line at the top, is the baseline against we're measuring uh, to determine the flexibility. So, and that's constructed um, uh, as in many of the DNO schemes by looking by averaging across historical data. Um, and then the actual usage as measured by the smart meter is shown there uh, below. Um, so that was a particularly good event. I believe it was one person contributing around six kilowatt hours over an hour. It would be dishonest of me to say that things always go so well. And I think this is a um, part and parcel of um, doing demand side response in domestic properties. Sometimes things unfortunately go in the other direction. So this graph shows an event where the actual usage as measured by the smart meter was higher than the baseline that we had um, estimated or calculated for that period. Um, and I think this will be uh, one of the many issues that you have to wrestle with in the domestic context, which um, does, doesn't apply so much in a commercial context where you, where you have much more control over dispatch. Um, I did want to comment briefly on uh, some of the benefits of, of that we found in, in using a standard, uh, in this case, open ADR, but many of these uh, benefits could apply to other standards. Um, I think we found that there's a huge amount of um, best practice and learning that's been incorporated into the open ADR standards um, based on 
their experience operating similar schemes in North America. And that's really useful to us uh, as we were starting from scratch. So we, we didn't need to anticipate all of the complexities that may have been required in the data model in order to uh, run, uh, enable, facilitate our, our demand side response. Um, the, this open ADR standard in particular, it's uh, quite flexible um, and, and it can um, meet the requirements of a lot of different use cases, including our own. Um, but the scope is not too broad. It's not overly complex, um, which might be the case with some standards. In the case of open ADR, there's, there's also this program guide, which may be discussed later. And we found this to be very, very useful in understanding how to apply the standard. Um, and in particular, pr providing a bridge for those who are actually implementing the, uh, the, the tool um, between those people and, um, and those who maybe understand the market and the commercial side a bit better. Uh, with OpenADR, there's also an existing ecosystem of products. Unfortunately, not so many available in the UK at the moment, but certainly many of the manufacturers who produce OpenADR products uh, around the world are also present in the UK. So it's hopefully maybe a, something that they could deploy here uh, in the near future. And there are many open source implementations available. That's not to suggest that you should necessarily use them, but they, it's, it's, it can be very useful to have an existing implementation to support development. Um, and finally, I would say uh, for a small organization with limited resources, it's, uh, it's incredibly uh, useful um, to be able to leverage a standard which has the backing of so many other organizations. I mean, it enables us to uh, actually meaningfully participate in this market. Um, I, I did, to end the presentation, I did want to make a final comment. Is I, I think when we started this uh, project, we saw many challenges um, as, as system integrators with the, um, with, with the deployment of DSR in homes and I think the, the one remaining challenge, which standards really have an important role to play in, and it's good to see it was one of the principles in Nina's talk, is, uh, is interoperability. Our single biggest issue now going into homes is that um, we simply cannot communicate or integrate uh, the appliances that we're increasingly finding in those homes that we want to include in our schemes. And this is batteries, EV chargers, and heat pumps. And although all of these have slightly different uh, problems in terms of integration and interoperability, which will, it's really, we need to resolve in order to make these systems work. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. I believe that we're now going to move on to the first Q&A session. Uh, very promptly. Um, and if some questions have been posted in the Zoom Q&A, so thank you. Um, thank you for those who've posted it in there. Um, I will, I'll probably start with a few of these questions to panelists. And um, then if there's any other questions, we can pick them up. Um, so, the first one in the Zoom questions, and this I'm guessing this is probably to Nina, is um, from Ian. It says, uh, given that there can be multiple SEMs and multiple DSRSP, where does the whole house integration sit? Hi, yeah, this is a really good question. And um, I think it's certainly something that's been discussed at the steering group and raised in the public consultation. I think that's where that point about PAS developing only the minimum specification is quite important. And PAS is specifying a minimum to deliver interoperable DSR, um, but it leaves that kind of whole house integration up to innovation. Um, and so I think whilst we're specifying a minimum SEM that does deliver interoperability for those response requests, you could provide a more sophisticated SEM or SEMs and appliances could exchange information together to do that whole house integration piece. Um, and there's quite a lot of work in the international standards landscape in that area. So 
we did quite a careful mapping exercise to make sure we weren't uh, reinventing the wheel. There's other work going on and there's obviously a lot of innovation happening in this space. So whilst we're specifying the minimum, that doesn't stop um, more sophisticated things being done on top of that. I don't know if you've uh, got anything to add then or want to take the next question. Are you going to keep comparing Ben to go through the questions? You might possibly be on mute if so. Oh, whoops. Thank you, Nita. <laughs> You're quite right. Um, <laughs> no I'd say that there's, there is a, another question probably for you, Nina, in the main chat window uh, from Matt Knight, uh, which says, is it correct that Bayes has a minded two position to route smart charging through the uh, smart metering system? And if so, is this covered by the PAS? as a use case. Yep, so again, really helpful question uh, to make sure that the information is getting out there. So what used to be the Office for Low Emission Vehicles, OLEV, but is now the Office for Zero Emission Vehicles, OZEV, um, they published a smart charging consultation in 2019 asking questions um, about smart charging in the UK. And they published a summary of responses to that consultation in May this year. Um, and the full government response is uh, gonna come in due course. And that, that consultation in 2019 was seeking views on device level regulations, which is what they talked about as phase one. But it was also gathering evidence on a longer term solution to smart charging, which they talked about as phase two. And for that evidence gathering piece on phase two, the GB smart metering system was uh, proposed as the current lead option. But the purpose of that consultation was to gather evidence on this for further policy development. So. That isn't a proposal at the current time. It's a current lead option to gather evidence on and do that further policy development work. And in terms of the PAS, the PAS has an optional Annex D, which sets out how both routine mode and response mode can operate via the GB smart metering system. So it provides those technical options uh, for both ways and government is doing further policy development uh, on the longer term approach. And there will be a response to that in due course. Over to you again, Ben. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give you another one, Lena. Um, so uh, Paul Barnfather uh, asks, uh, given the challenges of integrating smart appliances, could PAS 1878 be extended to cover batteries and solar? Yep, so again, um, interesting questions and good to be thinking about these these whole systems um so first of all PAS 1878 uh does cover domestic batteries those are very much in scope because their demand can be controlled however solar panels are quite hard to control the demand of unless you've got your magical weather machine uh, so solar panels have been left out of scope of that PAS but of course they would be important for integration with that whole house and again, there are, I think there are some existing standards internationally that would need to interface with the PAS. And BSI are doing a piece of work um, sort of on the future roadmap for these PAS standards and kind of where we go next and how it integrates with the wider standardization landscape and how it can be promoted to these international standards committees. And so I think some of these questions will be answered in that roadmap piece and recommendations can be given as to how the PAS can go ahead and integrate with other work going on in this area. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll, t I'll take one for myself now. Uh, Kate Simpson uh, asks, uh, do you see PowerShaper joining with your retrofit services to recommend tailored solutions? Um, so in response to that, um, I, it's, uh, I'd say it's, we've all, it's already being linked um, in, in different ways. So what, one of the things that I mentioned that was developed under the project was the um, smart meter um, integration. And um, uh, yeah, we're, we're already looking to use this um, as part of uh, baselining for um, uh, our, our retrofit assessment and delivery service. Um, so yeah, it's, we're, we're, we recognize um, the, the huge value that 
probably exists in connecting these things together, um, which goes in both directions, because um, obviously during retrofits, people are having a lot of this uh, type of equipment installed. And um, so there's a big opportunity there for us to also then carry on providing them with uh, a way to participate in demand side response schemes. Okay, um, I think what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to, we're going to move on to the next presenter uh, slightly early. Um, there'll be another opportunity for question and answers after the next two presentations. Um, it's, it would be very useful if uh, you could post them into the Zoom uh, Q&A um, feature. Um, and if you're having problems uh, finding it, please uh, let us know in the chat and we'll point you in the right direction. So the next speaker uh, is uh, Farina Faria from uh, the Energy Networks Association. Um, you have the floor. Thanks, Ben. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've just shared my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that okay. Um, so my name's Farina Ferrier. I work for the Energy Networks Association. I, so sorry, Farina, I can't see it uh, at the moment. I don't know. If... You know. Okay. Uh, let me try that again. There we go. Yes, okay. that's yeah. it. Brilliant. Right. Yeah, so my name's Farina Ferrier. I work for the Energy Networks Association. Um, I'm the project manager for the Open Networks project that I'll be talking to you about today. So um, the Energy Networks Association, so we're basically the trade association that represents some um, electricity and gas networks in the UK and in Ireland. So the Open Networks project, um, we're leading on behalf of our electricity transmission and distribution members. Um, just before I go on and talk about the project, I think, you know, um, some of the people have already previously discussed this, but as you know, we are seeing unprecedented change in the energy industry. So. Um, that's mainly driven by what's often referred to as the three Ds of um, decarbonization, digitalization, and decentralization. So the energy networks are at the heart of this change, and traditionally networks have been one-way power systems. And you know there is a need now for them to become um, smart and more flexible. So in in light of this challenge, the Open Networks project was set up back in 2017. So the project's essentially looking at how the networks need to change the way they operate to deliver this smart and flexible energy system in the future. So open networks is looking at, so this is also often referred to as the transition to distribution system operation. Um, so the project's not just um, a longer term and strategic project. We are also very much looking at how we can improve things for customers in the short to medium term. Um, so we recognize that this transition to DSO is multifaceted and we are looking at the various aspects of that through our work that I'll, I'll outline in the next couple of slides. So each year in the project, what we do is we set out our objectives for the year and we set up work streams to take each one of those forward. Um, for this year, we've based, so we, for this year, we've got six main areas of focus. Um, so the first one is the DSO transition work stream. So this work stream is the one that takes that longer term um, and more strategic focus. It's taking ownership of our overarching DSO implementation plan. So this work stream works with um, the other ones that you can see on the right hand side that are progressing the more short to medium term developments for DSO. Um, so today I'll mostly be talking to you about our work on flexibility services, but just want to highlight that we do have other work streams looking at other areas. We've got a work stream that is specifically looking at um, uh, how we can improve coordination between transmission and distribution. We've got a work stream that looks at um, connections, how we can improve the connections process for customers and how we can provide more information to those that are wanting to connect to the network. We've also got a work stream that is now looking at, it's taking a whole energy system perspective. So we are starting to work with our guest members to look at how we can optimize processes um, through more coordination between electricity and gas networks. And then we've also got a work stream that is looking at stakeholder engagement and comms. So 
we recognize that you know as we as we lead this transition you know we need to take our stakeholders with us in that journey so um the networks in in the uk are very much committed to taking a flexibility first approach so back in 2018 all the dnos made a commitment to openly test the market for for projects of significant value um and then building on that commitment um all the electricity networks then committed to a further six steps which are essentially principles for how they would um you know facilitate these markets so building on that so workstream 1a which is our flexibility services workstream it's it's taking the lead on defining and developing transparency and standardized approaches across all of the dnos so flexibility markets are still an emerging area um here in the uk and through the work that we've done in this work stream we're helping to um break down some of the barriers bring more standard standardization across you know the different ways across the different processes as the dnos develop them um so we've done quite a lot of work over the years and it would be fair to say that this is one of our highest areas of um highest priority um so on the right hand side the diagram shows um all the different products and deliverables that we've um with that we've been working on this year so i won't go through all of them but just to call out a few so we've got so um we basically over the years we've defined um we've come up with the standard definition of dso services or products that the dso's can procure from the market so these are for active power services so as part of this work with we we agreed a set of um, parameters that all the dnos can use in procuring the, these services and then another um key area of work that we've delivered this year is a common contract for flexibility so this is basically a commercial agreement that all the dnos um it's a single agreement that all the dnos have committed to use going forward so this helps to kind of you know makes it simpler for participants you know if there's a single contract that all the dnos are using so it then removes an additional um barrier and makes that participation a bit simpler um so this year across all the work that we've done in this work stream we we did a public consultation so we will be publishing um a summary of our uh, a summary of the responses that we received and our next steps some um, in in uh, in the next couple of days so that's that's pretty much the final slide i have um so that's everything from me Thank you Farina that's that's great um it's very interesting and uh there'll be a, a few questions for you afterwards as well which I've been saving up um so the the next talk uh is going to be from uh, Matt Watson from Western Power Distribution who's standing in for Ben Godfrey um he's part of the innovation team at Western Power Distribution and manages the future flex project so are you there matt yes i am can you hear me brilliant i can hear you yes right i will try and share my screen see if the technology works right can people see that screen yes we can see it great. thanks matt great great Um so thanks Ben. So I'm Matt Watson. I'm part of the innovation team at Western Power Distribution and today I'm subbing in for Ben Godfrey who sends his apologies. I think his wife had some emergency dental work that needed to happen. So um I've been asked to kind of to um fill in for him. Uh in terms of background I as I mentioned I'm part of the innovation team at WPD. I've been involved in flexibility projects for um the last 5 or 6 years developing a number of different projects including um helping develop our flexible power uh, proposition and then um since then moving forward into a few um newer projects including future flex which uh, I gather Ben was uh, going to talk to you about today um and so I thought uh, we could we could start by talking about what what the problem the kind of project is trying to look at and then we'll kind of talk about where we've got to so far So as Farina mentioned actually first generation DSO um ser services are being procured across GB um you know we are committed to assessing significant reinforcement against um flexibility options and that's very much part of our sort of BAU business as usual operations um 
and there's lots of really good work that um, that's happening both through individual DNAs but also through the Open Airways project to try and kind of standardize uh, what we're doing and to try and scale it up and make it kind of work for more um, participants. Um, but having kind of helped set up some of those kind of initial services, um, it's fair to say that they were designed with larger assets in mind. And, and this doesn't mean that we explicitly excluded smaller participants. In fact, we have a number of uh, participants um, in our services with domestic assets. It's just that we never um, sort of explicitly designed to be inclusive. And so um, with the sort of transition of um, some of the flexible power work into, our, our, into the main business, my role within the innovation team was to kind of look at where Sort of next generation flexibility services might um, sit what they might look like and one of the projects that we're looking at is future flex which is trying to understand how flexibility you know, so services might look if they've got a focus on the domestic side of things um, and the real kind of push throughout kind of all that we're doing um, on the innovation program is to try and kind of work out how we widen the pool of providers um, and uh, just trying to get more volume into these markets uh, so that we can kind of get some more competition um, and get some actually so some some well-functioning markets with plenty of liquidity um, so futureflex is looking at kind of how we make things accessible for uh, domestic participants and uh, initially i came up with a, a list of things i'd like to do and then i was reminded that actually we should probably start by talking to participants um, um, and seeing what barriers they thought were there and kind of how we could then res resolve those. So what we actually did for the project is started off by doing a series of workshops uh, back when you could do workshops um, and uh, basically got a whole load of uh, input from a number of different uh, participants and potential stakeholders in the kind of the world of um, domestic flexibility services to try and kind of highlight a number of different kind of uh, sort of barriers and then a number of um, potential solutions and effectively that's kind of where we've kind of moved forward. Um, the project itself is funded on the Network Innovation Allowance and we're sort of halfway through so we've been running for a year, uh, we've got another year to run and we're being um, supported through the project by Evros and Smart Grid Consultancy. Now, within the kind of the engagement uh, sec uh, section of the project we came up with a number of different ideas in terms of ways in which we could um, reduce barriers uh, we kind of went through a process to try and select the ones where we as a DNO had the biggest role to play and where there wasn't existing duplication so you know some of the stuff that came up was around uh, standardization of assets and I believe um, Bayes were on earlier talking about some of the work on the PASs um, so we thought, you know, if that work's already been happening, we don't want to kind of duplicate where I think we are feeding into that process as an organisation, but we kind of kind of work out where we can add value. And, and we effectively came up with four ideas, which two are slightly linked together. Um, the first was around kind of this kind of definition of what DSO Ready Home was, so trying to kind of understand what that might actually mean and trying to uh, take a more sort of customer centric view of um, flexibility services and how we could potentially um, kind of adapt our processes to the customer journey and kind of basically work out whether if there are processes along the way in which we can piggyback in to try and make assets flexible at times when it is easy to make them flexible rather than kind of having processes that are purely based on when we as a, de uh, as a distribution network uh, need them. And so Effectively, that's what we're doing, trying kind of working through um, some use cases. This is probably actually the workshop that, where we've actually um, that's kind of delayed and in, in, in or is the least advanced of all four. So we're, at the moment, we've kind of identified a number of sort of key personas of potential um, participants. We have this definition of what a DSO home might look like and kind of broken it into some sort of more personal attributes and some more technical attributes. And we're kind of looking to map some uh, mitigations through at the moment, decide where we go from there. Uh, the second workroom and probably the biggest is around this sustained H trial. So um, as Farina mentioned, one of the um, there are four standard services that we as DNO now DNOs now procure. They are sustained, secure, dynamic, and restore. Um, and whilst those names might mean relatively li limited, little to different people, they're, they're primarily about when 
we look to procure services and what we're trying to mitigate with those services. And the sustained product is um, a sort of a long term, far ahead scheduled service. So where, whereas you might have some of the other services where um, you kind of make sure the assets are available, you call them off on under utilization contracts. Um, sustain is very much around kind of trying to schedule things as far in advance. Um, and trying to give people some relative simplicity and sort of certainty in terms of what they're doing. And the thought within the trial was that actually something that is that um, simple could be actually be really useful for the domestic side of things to try and um, make things really simple for, for participants and hope that, that simplicity can then sort of translate across um, to customer offerings. And so within with that trial, we um, effectively designed the service over um, up until midsummer, and we actually went live with the sort of actual trials of this in early November. We're just about to start our first round of sort of feedback with participants now that they've been live for a month. Um, so that's kind of moving well. We have five participants who are live over the winter and then we'll get hopefully going to get another three that are going to join over the summer. And, and that service is very much around trying to simplify our requirements from participants. We have a very simple way of doing baselining. The service is very much a drop two service. So we try and make things super simple and it's an agreed level that, uh, that the effect of portfolio is dropping to an agreed amount over very set, very specific windows uh, to try and make things nice and simple. Um, um, we then kind of tied into that are doing some work on data and trying to understand the requirements that we have uh, on data uh, and kind of where they sit for participants. So acknowledging again that our kind of requirements for data were kind of put in place to kind of align with what we thought industrial participants might be able to provide and actually reviewing that to try and understand whether we can accept um, uh, lower qualities of data. So with flexible power, we accept mi we, we ask for minute by minute data. One of the things we're trying to understand is whether we can uh, uh, accept um, less granular data, potentially less accurate data, and what the potential trade-offs of that might be. So to try and do some rigorous analysis to help us understand whether whether we can accept it and whether what the sort of trade-offs of that are to really try and help us make sure that we are not sort of holding arbitrarily onerous uh, requirements on participants. And then the final piece of work that we're doing is looking at a methodology to assess the carbon impact of flexibility services. So one of the big bits of feedback we got from participants was around the, the fact that actually a lot of domestic flexibility is um, is relatively uh, green um, and actually that it would it, they feel that it because that isn't considered in DNO um, procurement of flexibility that they are um, sort of relatively disadvantaged in the competitive process. And so one thing we've been working through is sort of engaging with Bayes and Ofgem to try and understand how something like that might look. Um, interesting, we got some quite strong feedback that actually um, they probably didn't, the, Bayes, neither Bayes or Ofgem saw it as the sort of WPD or DNO role to kind of be assessing or to, to be valuing um, carbon intensity within um, our procurement services. I think their preference was to try and deliver something sort of bigger and more holistic. So something that you could that um, uh, would provide a more level playing field, a kind of a simpler piece and would avoid kind of uh, lots of DNOs trying to have their own implementations of this. But what they were really interested in was developing a more um, a sort of a, a methodology for actually trying to understand what the carbon impact of services were. So again, Evro's helped us um, develop a, a methodology to try and understand the relative carbon impact of various different technologies so that, uh, so that we can then feed that into the sort of wider debate on um, how these should be valued and slash advantaged or, or not. Um, so in terms of kind of what we've learned so far, there's been there's been an awful lot developed and different different parts of the project are at different stages. Um, uh, of which the sort of prolo carbon and the um, sustain H are probably the most advanced. Um, and I think one of the things that's been kind of really interesting through this process is we've seen a real um, appetite to trial domestic flexibility services. So we've had huge amounts of interest from 
various potential participants, much more than we initially expected, despite the fact that actually the value of the service is low. Um, you know, it is, it is relatively low, um, and yet people are still interested in participating um, and kind of adding this to kind of their sort of future revenue stack. Um, interesting was the number of, part of sort of, you know, uh, um, service providers being quite high. The actual number of assets has been quite low. So uh, most of them provided us with estimates of kind of up and lower bounds. We've tended to be towards, if not sort of lower than their lower bounds in terms of assets that are actually available to do this. And it shows, I think, the kind of the point we're at within the market at the moment where there's a lot of real interest. It's the, the thing that's coming, but actually um, having tangible assets to trial is still, it's still kind of, we're still just getting there. Um, but again, I, th I don't think that's particularly surprising. And inherently, we see the, the rate of installation of these assets accelerating going forward. That's what I would expect. Um, I think throughout the process, we've had some really interesting kind of learnings around process, both in terms of kind of what works and what doesn't. There's been some real challenges around uh, data protection and how we manage personal data. So if we're trying to kind of get into the world of domestic assets, we want to understand where they are, we need to we need to suddenly collect um, some data around them. That's often that can be deemed as personal, and so there's some fun challenges around all that. And and it kind of highlights with all this in the world of domestic flexibility, there's a real kind of importance in making sure that things are um, scalable and relatively simple. As we said, the value of the services is relatively low on a per asset level, and so we need to make sure processes are as streamlined as possible um, so you can get bring things through and actually some of the data challenges are things we're going to sort of be looking at in the second half of the project and then finally uh, one of the bits that came out was this sort of element around what the role of um, the DSO is in terms of carbon um, accounting and actually the view is that we should be informing um, policymakers around carbon impacts rather than sort of actively considering it in um, in our procurements at the moment and then we'll sort of see where um, policy kind of goes from there. So as I mentioned we're kind of about halfway through the trial um, and so we've got kind of few exciting bits going forward so um, we're still the sustained trial as I said we've been kind of running for the first month it's got another five months to go so we'll be sort of running over, over the next uh, few months and starting to collect some learning about how effective the response is um, understanding whether sort of our processes for collecting data and settling up or settling work uh, through that process we will be collating data and churning it through our sort of aggregated data work um, so we've already done some data analysis based on previous trial um, data we're keen to kind of supplement that and um, take it forward um, on the DSO Ready Homes piece we are at the moment sort of finalizing some of the interventions that we're looking to um, trial kind of trying to nail those down and we'll be starting to kind of look at sort of deploying them and sort of building those out properly in the new year and then as with all of our innovation projects we are keen to disseminate learning at events such like this so I think that's the whistle stop tour of what I was going to cover slash Ben was going to cover um, so I think if I pause things there, and I guess is it time for questions now? For the questions and answers session. So thanks for your presentation, Matt. And um, I mean, here at Carbon Co-op, working with householders, we, we also see the same large amounts of interest in participating in these schemes. So certainly growing appetite out there for participating in these new DNO schemes as you have seen. Um, so there's quite a few questions which have been building up over the last uh, 20 minutes. Um, uh, starting from a uh, question in the chat, I think this is mainly for Matt. I'll try to save your voice, Matt. Um, sorry. If there's a lot coming your way. Um, okay. This is from Don, uh, uh, part of the Open ADR uh, Alliance. Uh, he, he asks, uh, um, FutureFlex uh, seeks to accommodate a variety of uh, domestic flexibility solutions. Um, have you seen issues with connecting and managing resources that are purchased and owned by customers? For example, smart thermostats. 
so so on that with with future flex we've deliberately tried to focus our interaction in terms of our inter being interaction with the um, flexibility provider and have deliberately kept a pretty loose view as what's then happening between them and the end customer primarily because we're really interested in seeing how different people go about it and the difference in effectiveness of this and so we're kind of at the stage where we've um, signed up a number of participants they've committed to deliver services over a period of time we've had the first month of delivery now um, and I should be getting data in terms of kind of how they've performed in the next week and then I might be able to start to answer the kind of question of how reliable they are but inherently we're trying to be relatively open as to kind of how different parties almost implement that second piece because um, inherently that, that we kind of want to see differentiation and kind of you know different um, levels of expertise kind of work their way through work their way through that so I feel like I haven't really answered your question but it's probably that's kind of the focus <laughs> not the focus of the project we have had actually done other projects where we've tried to do things like integrating with different low carbon technologies so i've also been managing a project called made which is about kind of multiple low carbon technologies rather than necessarily smart thermostats and um passive systems who have been helping us with that one of the things they do bring out is the challenge around kind of coordinating multiple uh, low carbon technologies and the difficulty that comes with actually controlling them so if they, they try and act as a sort of third party controller across all of them it has been quite onerous gaining control over these different things um, and so kind of they I think one of the pushes they're doing is trying to kind of standardize and I think they're kind of feeding into one of the presentations that I saw was happening earlier that I think they are feeding into some of the PAS work um, that's happening through the BSI. Yeah. Um, so the next question, there's two, I think, possibly related questions here, um, uh, probably for Matt, but Farina may also have some view on it. Um, so Jody from Regen asks, um, whose view is it that carbon accounting shouldn't be considered in the procurement of flex? And um, Bruce Health asks, um, would you please speak a bit about what metric you use when going about establishing the cost effectiveness for flex demand? Um, okay. So, what elements so, are considered? Yeah. And on the cost effectiveness of flex demand, is that so that's just general cost whether we whether we want to um, run it or not? Okay. Um, so if I pick up the first one around um, the low carbon piece and what our role is, so. Um, so originally part of the, the kind of the reason we picked up this role around kind of why we should do low carbon stuff is it came up as part of our workshops of quite a strong view that we should be taking a more active view on carbon and so the original kind of scope of the work was to kind of do a piece of work that help us assess the carbon impact and then work out you know a way of integrating that into potential procurement processes we then took that to Bayes and Offgem this was probably start of the summer kind of time and there was a uh, at that point, I think they just they were doing some workshops about trying to kind of understand their policy on um, carbon signals into markets going forward. Um, and there was quite a strong view that um, ultimately they would prefer a they would see a, a sort of wider policy acting to kind of create um, carbon signals as a much neater solution. I think effectively they kind of see the, the world of carbon uh, signals and pricing as being one that's at the moment probably quite complex and difficult to see whether it's a level playing field and therefore adding an extra person with another set of signals to them I think felt like quite a complex piece and potentially add some quite difficult kind of bits for the DNO um, and so we're kind of steered away from that and to focus on the kind of quantification of, of carbon impact and if you want to see the methodology we've that Ever has developed on that is a really interesting methodology with some some really good good answers but also some really interesting questions that come out of the back of it around kind of how you measure carbon impact and whether you use kind of um average or marginal carbon intensities off the back of it i think the interesting bit around kind of what whether we should or shouldn't be doing is is it, i guess it's still something that bays are thinking so i attended a workshop recently um that they were holding around on on this kind of topic and it's very interesting to see the kind of range of feedback and actually there were a lot of people who are much more pro some more sort of direct um intervention by um 
DNOs, I guess from our perspective, we're not too fussed either way, as long as we've got a clear metric that allows us to understand things correctly. And if there is going to be additional cost associated with kind of assessing um, things with carbon, we can pick that out. But I think we're not too, um, we're happy to go either way and whichever way kind of Bayes lean at the end will kind of support. Um, the yeah. second one, sorry, go for it, Farina. Thanks, Maggie. Yeah, I was just going to kind of build on that and, and say that, you know, the way the networks are currently regulated, like we're not actually allowed to discriminate on the basis of technology. So um, the license conditions require the DNOs to choose the most cost effective solution for the customer. So I think, you know, that's that's been that's been a bit of a barrier, but I think that that's something that will be addressed through that wider piece of work that Bayes are looking at. And ultimately, the, the piece they're coming from is, I think, is the view that uh, ultimately, if they can get the wider regulation framework in the UK right, then, it, you know, ultimately carbon impact or carbon intensity will be framed in pricing. So, you know, we've already seen in the last however many years that um, certain assets are finding it harder and harder to participate in flexibility services due to things like the medium combustion plant directive and various other kind of carbon reducing elements. And so I think the view is that effective as, as they kind of review and reform that, that sort of wider um, policy uh, sort of framework, then hopefully things will then kind of um, fall in line um, for us. And then the second question, can you remind me what that one was again? Yes, sure. Um, it's from Bruce Health. He says, he asks if you could uh, speak a bit about what metric you use when going about establishing the cost effectiveness and uh he's he is particularly interested in discounting associated with greenhouse gas emission avoidance uh potentially being part of that or not and are we and this might be it might not be covered in the questions this focused at the kind of initial decision making stage for whether we should be using flexibility or not or is this kind of more focused on the sort of what do we dispatch when kind of uh, I they're two, I they're two yeah things, yeah but in both interesting yeah well i think it's the first one yeah okay um farina you up to date with the latest work on the um uh sort of um uh, work stream yeah. 1a p1 uh, around yes. sort of common cba yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to kind of cover that. Yeah, so I think one of the products that I probably didn't describe in a lot of detail is a common evaluation methodology that we're also looking at developing. So as part of that, um, basically, like we, we've established a methodology that all DNOs will use to, um, you know, basically like decide which solution is the most optimum one for meeting a particular network need, like whether that is um, a traditional reinforcement solution or a flexibility solution. So I think to, to kind of answer Bruce's question, it, basically, I think from a DNO's perspective, I, I think, you know, it, the tool actually helps, you know, if you basically like it helps you compare um, reinforcement to flexibility. And, and as I mentioned earlier, so basically like the DNO's would choose um, the most cost effective option. So I think the value of that would be driven from, you know, the value of, of reinforcement. And I think in the tool isn't aren't there options for uh, considering sort of um, wider benefits? Uh, with all this, I have to I have to confess I haven't been that close to this um, process. So it's kind of a lot of what I've done is trying to remember, trying to hark back to what I remember. That, but there are options for considering some of the sort of um, non-direct benefits that are sort of also covered through that methodology. I think. That, that's right yeah so it, it does let you look at other factors as well but yeah i'm not sure if, I, if i've properly answered the question around the cost effectiveness side um but yeah i think the tool basically allows you to make a more holistic um d decision based on looking at a number of other factors as well okay thank you that's uh, interesting to hear about um I, I have saved up a, a difficult and controversial question, which for you, Farina, although other people may want to express their opinion as well. So um, Bruce Nordman says, um, since time of use prices better reflect grid needs uh, than flat prices, 
why not just move to much more dynamic prices that can precisely reflect grid needs instead of uh, having people like aggregators dispatching uh, assets explicitly. That's definitely a difficult one. So I wouldn't <laughs> say like price signals are my area of expertise, but um, I think Ofgem are doing some some work on on looking at. Um, so they've basically got a significant code review on at the moment. So I think price signals are something that will be looked at as part of that. But sorry, I'm not close to the detail on that. Right, should I try and pick that one up a bit? Um, because I think yeah. th this is the kind of question I find really interesting, and I find I think this is the. This is, I think you can tell a lot about my personality by the fact that I find this interesting. Um, <laughs> but I think that the, that the kind of balance between um, tariff based um, signals and more direct intervention signals is a really interesting piece. So, as you kind of currently noted, that you know, most tariffs at the moment are flat. Um, interestingly, on that, all DNO actually, DNO GOS tariffs are all now um, in half hourly increments. It's just the fact that the data we get is effectively set from profiles that have um that that don't have that level but effectively we're kind of set up to you know we do have red different pricing based on different time bands i guess the big kind of question about this kind of how you get to more dynamic pricing and i think that's tied to a few different things there's the um there is the significant code review that for you mentioned which is all about trying to work out how we do network pricing so uh, or network pricing and access so we we've as we mentioned, we do have half hourly sort of different rates, uh, different times that peak at certain key times, but those are sort of done at a sort of license area level. Um, part of that significant code review is to kind of look at kind of exactly how we do that, where the boundaries are. Um, it's been a piece of work that I think has been due imminently for quite a while um, and it's, you know, has, has, the, has the potential to quite fundamentally change the sort of price signals that go into um, markets i think you're also really dependent on um things like the smart metering and half hourly settlement because um until you get into that kind of those kinds of realms you don't actually have the data to then kind of send tariffs off the back of it but as all these things pull together i think it's um that the balance you have between the two is really interesting so we've done um uh, plenty of trials where you look at, um, again, I'm going to point to our made trial where they looked at um, participant responding to a, a dynamic time of use tariff. So they, they were um, based on the Octopus Agile tariff. And it's interesting in that tariff, a large chunk of the price differential between peak and off peak is due to the associated distribution cost. Um, and again, you had assets that pretty much avoided peak unsurprisingly because they were flexible they could avoid the peak and it worked quite well and i think um, as you kind of move into kind of more complex tariffs you will inherently sort of kind of see a, a sort of change in core behavior i think within the sort of wpd view we kind of see almost tariffs as kind of sitting at the sort of bottom of a pyramid where they're not necessarily the most targeted signals and there's some big questions as to kind of how targeted they should be because often if they're particularly targeted they're also particularly volatile which people aren't always the biggest fans of and they kind of sit at the bottom if you get them broadly right then you don't need as much you know you get a whole load of kind of core flexibility in what you're doing and then you build up to more targeted interventions that go well actually maybe we need to almost provide a more acute signal in this specific location and that's where things like some of the more direct flexibility services sit interesting on the flex on the future flex stuff that we're doing it sort of sits somewhere in between a sort of really targeted thing and, and a pricing piece and one of the bits we're interested to find out is whether that is the best of both worlds or the worst of both worlds and that's kind of one of the things we'll try and come out of the, the tariffs i think my after that long-winded explanation the some the probably the, the response to the question is we do want to get tariffs right because i think it it leaves you in a much better position to require a lot less active flexibility if you get them sort of set up right can i just jump in there and build on on that as well yeah i think i think when matt was talking about that pyramid of if you get the tariffs right then you don't need to go to the next level up and if you get that right you don't need to go to the next level up I think that kind of speaks to that demand side response hierarchy that I was presenting where you have that routine mode at the bottom, which is where most of the time as a baseline, you take in your incentives, you can try and optimize based on them. 
until we've got incentives that are perfect, you aren't going to get exactly something that precisely reflects grid needs, are you? Um, but you should absolutely do the best thing you can. If, if all of those incentives aren't exactly the right perfect signal to definitely get the right balance of supply and demand, you are going to need that response mode on top saying, actually, if you've got a bit of flexibility on top, we didn't quite get it right. And so we now need response mode on top. But if you did get routine mode perfect, you would and you'd never have any need to call response mode, would you? Um, but I don't know how good everyone feels their forecasting is both of consumer demand and of the weather for renewable energy supply. So until we get perfect on our routine mode, I think, yeah, we are going to need those higher level of the pyramids for a little while. But it's a really interesting question. But it's nice to see that kind of same structuring Matt was talking about is being built into the PAS as well. OK, thank you, everyone. That's that was very interesting. Um, so we're, we're now going to move on to part two of this workshop. So um, I'd like to thank um, Matt and Farina and Nina um, for their presentations and their answers to the questions. And hopefully they'll also be joining us later um, in the interactive discussion. Um, what I'm going to do now is hand over to my colleague, Jonathan, who's going to introduce and uh, host the next session. Thanks, Ben. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, my name's Jonathan. Uh, I'm at Carbon Co-op. I work with Ben on some of the flexibility work and also on um, whole house deep retrofit as well. Um, so we're based in Manchester. Um, and excitingly, the next session is going to have uh, three people from potentially three different time zones, I think. Um, so, yeah, the whole uh, theme of the session is about standards based approaches uh, for distributed energy. And so what is a standard that's out there that we can look at um, and we can examine uh, some real case studies? Well, open ADR. Um, and that's, uh, for me, is one of the most exciting and interesting parts of today is to, uh, yeah, get some real world experience on you on using uh, a standards based approach somewhere else in the world. Um, yeah, so we've got three speakers, all with a slightly different take and different experience, um, all, as I say, slightly different parts of the world. Um, first up, we've got Rolf, Rolf Beinhardt who's Managing Director at the Open ADR Alliance and uh, is speaking to us from California. Um, hi, Rolf, are you there? Yes, I am here. Thank you, Jonathan. Great, uh, take it away. Perfect, uh, thank you so much. I mean, super interesting to hear uh, of all these projects earlier. And of course, uh, <laughs> Open ADR uh, has been mentioned uh, several times. So I wanted to take this opportunity to really give a brief, uh, a little more in-depth uh, intro on what Open ADR actually does. And then as Jonathan already mentioned, we'll hear uh, from our friend Walt a little bit more about how it can connect locally. And uh, then we'll, we'll see a nice, uh, a nice use case from, from Stan as well here. So let's hop uh, right in here then. Um, no, come on, move. There we go. So in short, Open ADR is a communication protocol as you have already noticed, I suppose, uh, based on what the previous speakers talked about. And we are communicating uh, different types of signals between a demand response service provider. Uh, here in the US, most of the time, this is a utility and uh, resources downstream, basically. This communication can be done directly to, let's say, buildings, even cars, things like that, or it could go through uh, some aggregator um, and that could be, of course, an aggregator company um, whose business it is to provide power back to the utility, or it could be uh, something more of a facilitator, which simply creates the connectivity between the control system and the downstream devices. Uh, something like this you can imagine, for instance, like a cloud-based thermostat control, where the open ADR signal would be received in a cloud controller that is operated by the thermostat uh, provider. And then 
uh, they might have um, either standardized or proprietary means to communicate with each uh, uh, thermostat in a building, for instance. So that being said, uh, again, uh, we are an open, uh, non-proprietary protocol. Anybody can download the specification. And um, we have been uh, working really hard on certification and other aspects here. So let's look at the timeline a little bit, uh, because this is not entirely new. Um, some of you uh, may uh, remember, um, if you were involved in smart grid or the utility in general, um, that in the early 2000s, uh, California suffered an energy crisis due to mismanagement of, uh, of reserves. And after that, um, the California Energy Commission put out a grant um, that uh, stipulated that we wanted to have a more automated way of doing demand side management and demand response. Uh, as many of you certainly know, the idea of demand response is not new. And in the US, it has been uh, used uh, for decades. Uh, but mainly, we have phone calls or later text messages, one way pages, and things like that, which, of course, limit the uh, usability and, of course, also limits the, the response times um, and therefore a more uh, automated communication um, model was needed here. So in the early 2000s, then there were a number of trials and eventually OpenADR 1.0 uh, was released by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab as an open standard. Uh, however, based on this effort from the California Energy Commission, this was very much focused on the California utilities. But uh, around that time, we also saw increased activities in the overall smart grid and interoperability space. So very quickly, uh, we added additional requirements to this to make it more uh, broad uh, beyond California. And in 2010, the OpenADR Alliance was formed to really uh, provide a coherent framework here, testing and certification. And then you can see there were a number of different efforts uh, that happened uh, almost in parallel in the beginning, uh, additional standardization through OASIS, uh, which is an open uh, standards group for internet technologies. And after we put out our specification, we also pushed it through uh, the IEC process. And in November of 2018, um, the OpenADR 2.0b specification was published as uh, IEC 62746-10-1. So we are an IEC standard um, as well. One of the next efforts um, we are looking at is actually uh, Europe based. So we are looking at uh, a liaison with uh, Sen Senelec uh, because they have been uh, looking at EV charging program controls and things like that. And we are also uh, pursuing uh, some opportunities in local standardization, for instance, in Germany and uh, hopefully also in other countries. So uh, since uh, there are a number of Europeans here on the call, if um, anybody is interested in helping out here, we would welcome any additional input and of course also any support in these kind of organizations. So a shameless call for, <laughs> for help here uh, today. And so that being said, so where are we today? Uh, the OpenADR Alliance is a nonprofit organization uh, based in California. And uh, aside from the standard, we also manage the testing and certification program. As you have seen in the timeline, 2.0a and 2.0b profile specifications have now been completed for over uh, seven uh, years. And to date, we have te eight test houses uh, from Japan uh, to the US to Canada. Um, and we are talking to um, a couple of them also in Europe. And uh, we are certainly open for, for additional ones as well. And we have now, in fact, I just counted earlier today, 216 certified uh, products and about 160, 165 members. In fact, we have added, despite the pandemic, um, over, yeah, I would say, 
almost 15% of uh, member companies in the last uh, in the last six or eight months. So everything here uh, is definitely on an upwards uh, trajectory. So now let's look a little closer at um, how OpenADR actually works. So we are talking about two primary entities or actors uh, in an OpenADR communication link. We have the virtual top node or VTN, which is essentially the server. And um, I believe uh, Nina uh, had a good name for it. Uh, so for us here, it's typically a demand uh, response management a server or system or distributed energy resources management system, which, as I mentioned, typically sits at the utility level and manages the resources underneath. It creates and transmits uh, the messages uh, that uh, OpenADR uh, can, uh, can communicate. And it also can request reports and other feedback from the resources out there. On the other end, we have what we call the virtual end node or VEN, uh, essentially the client to the server. Uh, and uh, consequently, they will receive the messages from the server and uh, then control uh, the demand side resources. Uh, one key aspect here that I always like to mention is that each of these links that you see here is independent from each other. So we are not creating a large scale network here um, that uh, you know, pushes OpenADR messages through uh, a middleman down to the building. No, this is rather a communication between here, in this case, the utility and the aggregator. Then the aggregator would process that information and would create completely new and different messages uh, to their connected customers in order to fulfill this request. Or like I said earlier, if it's only a facilitator, uh, they could receive uh, the signal here and then by any means uh, available to them would communicate to the buildings or other resources out there in the field. So again, VN, VTN, an important concept here. Now let's look briefly at the main services of OpenADR. So we have the event service, which is, uh, I would say, the, the service that's, uh, um, yeah, I would say, used in pretty much 100% of the use cases at this point. And you can imagine a, an event in OpenADR very, very similar to a calendar notice. So if you think about today's meeting here, um, you probably have it on your calendar or you received a, a calendar notice from a Zoom um, or through other means. And uh, you have a start time and end time. And then in that calendar notice that you received today, you also have the agenda with specific time slots. And in fact, OpenADR does something very, very similar. So you have the event with a start and end time or start time and duration. And then within the event, you can provide a multitude of different uh, yeah, agenda items, if you will. And we call them intervals. Uh, so they can be um, subsections of time within the overall uh, event. And in each of them uh, can be a number of different signal types. So the mainly used signal types are of course, price, uh, price communication has become a, a very integral part of many programs here. And then uh, aside from pricing, there can be a, a multitude of different energy messages um, that you know, can rely on either up or down regulation, specific set points for, uh, for HVAC systems and so on and so forth. So there's, there's a large number of different uh, signal types available in the event uh, service here. Then uh, the opt service, um, we're starting to see a little bit of usage uh, for that. It defines uh, availability schedules. So it's, it's a way for the VEN, the client or the resource to telegraph their availability schedules up to the utility. This is of course, uh, going to become more and more 
interesting as um, you know utilities need to plan you know further ahead and know what's uh, what what can happen and what can be achieved uh, using the resources out there in particular if we are looking at batteries uh, evs um, potentially vehicle to grid integration uh, things like that um, where we are seeing more and more different resources connecting these schedules might become a very uh, a very useful tool the report service i briefly mentioned that already uh, on the previous slide is essentially feedback um, you can a request feedback from the resources. Uh, this can either be historical data, so previous usage, previous, previous savings, things like that. It can be um, basically on time, uh, immediate uh, telemetry, um, like whether the resources are online, whether they currently cycle on or cycle off in case of, for instance, air conditioning, things like that. It could be the charge state of batteries and so on and so forth. And it could also contain future data. So forecasting um, that um, uh, can be sent up to the utility. Of course, this is all subject to availability in the VEN because not all systems, of course, have either historical, uh, current or future uh, forecast data to provide, but the protocol itself allows uh, for this to be implemented here. Then last but not least here in this list, the register party service uh, is a very low level um, registration service to, uh, to connect the devices, essentially the VEN to the VTN. Everything in OpenADR is currently done in XML payloads. Uh, we are often getting the question about um, JSON and other and other let's call them more current uh, languages here and we, we are keeping an eye on this and if there is enough uh, interest we may uh, do this um, you know provide a, a JSON a version of OpenADR eventually but I, I want to categorically mentioned that currently the efforts have not started and the main reason of course is interoperability we have uh, like I said, over 215 certified systems, both VENs and VTNs out there. And uh, we need to be really careful that we are not um, yeah, breaking interoperability uh, down the road. So if we do this, we want to make do this right and uh, have the servers, uh, the server manufacturers agree to adding this uh, so that we are not running into, into issues in the future. Um, I briefly mentioned in the beginning that we typically communicate through the internet and in most cases, this is through existing internet uh, broadband service. And in some instances, it can be through dedicated internet connections. For instance, if you really want to make sure that you have uh, good connectivity and no issues with firewalls and things like that or if the VEN is simply far out away from other communication means, uh, we have seen uh, things like, for instance, cellular modems being used for these type of uh, resources. An interesting use case here in California is, for instance, irrigation water pumps that are far out um, away from everything else out in the fields and, uh, and could be controlled with uh, um, dedicated uh, cellular internet access. Our security uh, uses TLS 1.2 as the transport layer security. We do require server and client certificates. And I'm, I'm going to be honest, I know that uh, one of the trickiest parts in implementing OpenADR is, in fact, cybersecurity, because not many uh, manufacturers are used to having client uh, certificates. And of course, there's also a small a fee connected to that, um, which um, you know, is relevant, but this was the only way for us to obtain a cybersecurity approvals through IEC or NIST in the US and, and other entities. Uh, so um, this is this is the security that we have uh, chosen uh, and it fulfills all the requirements currently out there. And we have our own uh, CA, which we um, yeah not own, but uh, manage through a, a third party that provides the OpenADR uh, certificates. Now, 
couple of words on the, the, the idea behind OpenADR. We are not a control and command standard. So we, we don't, do not intend to turn on or turn off things, but rather we try to inform and motivate the systems out there. So as you have seen, you know, we can transport uh, these event messages to uh, an aggregator or we transport it directly to, for instance, a gateway um, or other devices out there. And because our messages are fairly um, indirect, if you will, there, there is really a very simple way to integrate all of this with other downstream uh, standards and uh, OCPP was mentioned earlier and we'll hear from uh, Stan I believe on that as well for uh, charge station control, EE bus built for building control, uh, of course here in the US Zigbee other uh, building control standards and so on and so forth. The integration is, is really simple here because the OpenADR signal can be terminated in any type of controller or gateway and then the uh, intelligence of that uh, gateway product would then manage the, the downstream uh, systems. No direct translation is therefore necessary here either because again, they're, they're, we, we leave it open to the manufacturers to apply their, their intelligence on all of this. All right, so um, just a little overview again here to, to recap on, on all of this. Um, the original intent, of course, of OpenADR was peak load management and just peak shaving um, due to, you know, uh, overuse of, of energy. But as you can imagine, over the last few years, we have uh, seen this uh, changing quite a bit where, um, you know, we're integrating uh, all kinds of different uh, resources, not only resources that can down cycles so save energy, but then also resources that can um, increase power consumption um, or even feed power back into, into the grid. So all of this could go directly to the resources, as you can see down here, or through an, a controller, which I already uh, mentioned a few times. Now, I wanted to set the stage also for uh, the next speaker later by saying that there are some additional ideas for the local connectivity. And um, while you can transport the uh, OpenADR signal, of course, again, to like a gateway device or even directly to a device uh, through their own device controller, thermostat, or, or a controller right on, for instance, an air conditioning unit, as it is shown here. There is another way of connecting uh, using what we call a CTA2045 um, module interface, which is a plug-in uh, device, um, which, you know, is we are seeing more and more interest in that here in the U.S., to, for instance, equip appliances and things like that with this type of uh, device. And uh, Walt will tell us a little more uh, about that here in just a minute. So I wanted to flick through a few uh, use cases really quickly only um, because um, I think you can review them yourself in, uh, in detail, but just some typical things here. Um, critical peak pricing, um, as I mentioned, was, was one of the first ideas here where in this case here for instance the Sacramento Municipal Utility District uh, communicates different types of of prices uh, throughout the day and they can they can be modified they can change they can change times and things like that and they are being sent with what we call simple signals by just using numbers um, one two three four or zero one two three to communicate these different prices then a slightly uh, more recent program, uh, Bring Your Own Thermostat, um, is uh, run by Southern California Edison, where you can select uh, a multitude of different uh, thermostats that you want to use, and they can all connect through a cloud-based control system then to the Southern California Edison OpenADR uh, server here. Again, you can review this all in detail, of course, later. Ancillary services, uh, spinning reserves and non-spinning reserves, 
Here are some of the parameters used by Hawaiian Electric. Um, again, you can uh, take a look at that uh, at your leisure here. And, um, and then one of the other more recent uh, projects here from Pacific Gas and Electric is, is moving a little bit more towards you know, price responsive demand side management. Um, you could call it transactive energy if you want, even though it's not necessarily customer to customer. Um, but essentially, um, the, uh, the prices are being communicated here and uh, the, the resources can then um, respond to the different prices as they, as they choose. Another interesting uh, project uh, just to go a little bit outside of the US is uh, Kansai Electric, uh, also using uh, different systems here uh, with OpenADR to manage uh, also battery storage and, and solar. And uh, the project was uh, uh, funded by uh, METI, the ministry in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the area there and uh, runs uh, several of the OpenADR certified uh, products in here as well. Uh, in a, on another uh, topic, uh, gas. Uh, gas has also become um, interesting for uh, demand response. And uh, the National Grid, for instance, is using OpenADR uh, through some of our member products uh, also to regulate uh, their gas consumption uh, in, this, in this area there. Um, last but not least, um, this is an already an older project and has been expanded quite a bit, um, charging stations. And I'm not going to talk much about it because uh, Stan is uh, certainly uh, way more familiar with uh, these uh, charge station management systems. And we'll talk about that in a second. If anybody is interested in in uh, really scientific research, um, there was a project and it's linked down here. I'm, I'm pretty sure you will be able to get the, the slides later. Um, interesting virtual power plant project. Uh, again, very scientific, um, calculating many of the different uh, systems here for a, a shipping yard with uh, battery storage, solar, uh, electric vehicle fleet and so on and so forth. So um, for uh, those of you that are more um, science oriented, really, really nice project. With that, uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention today. And I'll turn it over to or back to Jonathan first and then to Walt, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, Rolf. And uh, it was really fascinating to see the use cases, to see how that standard is implemented and, and the real flexibility, um, so to speak, of the different ways it can be implemented. Uh, it was really interesting to hear that the gas as well as part of that. Um, before we hand over to Walt, just one thing to highlight. If you've got any questions for any of our speakers um, in, this, in this part, please do post them in the Q&A box and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the three speakers. Um, we also have another kind of um, free for all session uh, from five o'clock onwards, um, if, if anyone's got any questions for any of the speakers. Um, so yeah, we'll just hand over to Walt Johnson now from the US Electric Power Research Institute. And uh, Walt's gonna talk in particular about open ADR and CTA 2045 compatibility uh, uh, demand response uh, standard there. Are you with All us, right. Walt? Yes, uh, can you hear me okay? I'm gonna figure out uh, <laughs> how to get my slide to show here. We can, we can hear you. Where, where are you speaking to us from? I am speaking from California. Oh, another one. Apart from Rolf. Yes, yes. Uh, can another you see my slides? Uh, are we... not, not yet, no. Is that working any better? Let's see. Uh, no. Have you have you used the share screen or the, or in the toolbar? There's a little. There should be a green. Let me, yeah, let, me, let, me, let me go find. Uh, my screen is blocking. There it is. All right. Uh, let's see. We want to, we want to show this one. Oops. And swap this. How's that? 
Oh, no, not yet, I'm afraid. Oh, you, have interesting. You, have you clicked on the share screen? Um, I did. Yeah. Yes. Oh. And it and it brought up some options. Yes, it did. <laughs> uh, and it's saying desktop one or two. And oh, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think I'm, I think I've discovered something. <laughs> uh, Oh, I need a, I need to make a security change. It looks like here. Okay, we can bear with um, you. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> I wonder if Rolf is still with us. Whether you could tee up um, Walt's work, uh, what, what he's going to talk about. That would also. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Why is that um, not doing he has my slides. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. So that's an option. Yeah. Sorry. Go on, Rob. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I think, um, you know, it's, uh, it's really interesting because uh, the appliance manufacturers in the US um, and in particular here also on the West Coast have since a while, uh, you know, have tried to figure out how to best make their appliances smart grid ready. As you can imagine, and, and as many people certainly know, um, appliances have a very, very uh, slim profit margin and there's a strong competition you know, to keep prices low because of course consumers would, uh, would buy you know the slightly cheaper one if it has the same features mm. and so on right so um the the idea here um was okay how can we do a um uh, or how can we get an appliance smart grid ready um when uh, when when there's so many different means of communications out there right from wi-fi Bluetooth, Zigbee, mm. or, you know, other wireless technologies. Um, and uh, this, this modular interface, CTA 2045, provide an interesting option here. So mm -hmm. uh, the regulations in Washington state, for instance, now <laughs> mandate uh, the usage of CTA 2045. And we are in fact working on incorporating CTA 2045 certification uh, into uh, the Open ADR Alliance as well. Great, fantastic. I think we're there, Walt. And Are I you think seeing my, uh, you seeing can, the control screen? Uh, we can you... see, uh, we can see in presentation mode. So you're, you're good to go. Uh, okay, so... you're, seeing, you're, you're seeing the full screen. Yes. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Multiple screens and multiple security things here. Uh, well, thank you, Rolf, for uh, the, the, the brief introduction. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so um, my name is Walt Johnson. Uh, I recently retired actually last year from uh, the Electric Power Research Institute here in California, uh, where I was a technical executive. Most of my work uh, there was actually focused on the open ADR uh, work, but the group that I was with also worked on a, another standard for the end device connectivity, uh, the CTA 2045 standard of the Consumer Technology Association. Um, my ambition here, uh, since we haven't talked about CTA so far in this morning's uh, or this afternoon's <laughs> sessions, uh, is to do a little introduction. Rolf teed up a little bit about what the motivation was here, but I want to talk a little bit about CTA. This is not a tutorial. I don't have time to do a tutorial on, on the CTA standard, though. But I'll tell you enough to, to understand, I think, why we care about its interaction and compatibility with um, OpenADR. Um, so with that, let me start by, by hearkening back to the earlier days of, of uh, portable computing. Uh, back before we had, uh, you know, universal Wi-Fi and, and, and uh, other sorts of uh, you know, Bluetooth and other things built into our, um, our computers. And we used to carry around these little dongles, these little, these little devices that you could plug into some standard port on the PC that would give you cellular access, which frankly, most of the time you still have to do if you want a cellular, but to give you an ethernet port or to give you a, a, a Wi-Fi access or whatever. Um, the idea of CTA 2045 is similar. Uh, the idea is that by putting a standard port or electrical interface and physical interface on the, uh, on the, on the appliance or what we call the smart grid device in, in the standard, 
Uh, we can then plug in a variety of modules that, that meet a certain form factor that contain essentially a smart plug, a smart plug-in module that can perform uh, a variety of useful functions. Uh, in addition to providing connectivity, a, a path, let's say a cellular modem or, or a FM radio sideband uh, um, listening device, a variety of different technologies for communication, it also has enough uh, capability to be able to add some intelligence to the device. So by, by specifying a standard um, physical port and a standard electrical signal and a, a, a protocol, a, a set of messages uh, across that, we can then uh, build all the appliances with just this single interface, this single port, and not have to worry about building an ethernet version or an open ADR version or a Wi-Fi version or whatever different kind of either communication or, uh, or command or, or control or information protocol and essentially outboard all that into a low cost module that can be plugged in at the time of deployment uh, of the appliance. So that's the basic motivation for why, open, why CTA 2045 was created. Um, it's now available in a variety of devices, um, originally in prototype form for the original work that EPRI was doing on this, but now it's being, it, it's, it is appearing in, in the commercial runs of some of these uh, vendors products. And, and we've used them uh, in a variety of, of devices um, ranging from, uh, pool pumps to hot water heaters, uh, both resistive and uh, uh, heat pump, um, and a variety of EVSEs and other sorts of equipment. So the idea is that, that by using this standard plug interface on each of those, uh, the manufacturer provides access to, or optionality to provide access to any number of communications mechanisms, as well as potentially um, demand response or demand flexibility kinds of protocols. The device actually comes in two forms. Uh, so like any helpful standard, it actually is there are two standards involved. Uh, there's a large one and a small one, basically. The, the, the smaller one uh, shown in the lower right in this picture uh, is intended for, for uh, low power devices um, and such as thermostats. Uh, and there are manufacturers who have a port for this on their thermostats. Uh, and then the larger one on the left is intended for, for um, higher power and has a larger set of pins, more, more electrically robust, and, and for that matter, mechanically robust, and is usually used with uh, such things as water heaters or HVAC units and such. The idea of it is that the manufacturer can, only, can build one model of, of device and not have to build models of you build into the device all the different communication standards or communication options that he can imagine a customer might want. That problem is offloaded to the little module that plugs into the port. So there's flexibility in the path. It can, it can use whatever kind of uh, communication uh, technology is built into the module. It future proofs your asset because let's say you want to upgrade or change or the standard for the st protocol changes, you simply need to replace the module. There's no change in the uh, in the underlying appliance uh, or, or smart grid device. Um, it divorces or separates the, the innovation uh, and upgrades and things uh, in the technology and, and uh, demand protocol kind of area uh, so that you can replace these more quickly. This, the, these kinds of appliances often have a fairly long lifetime, uh, longer than is typical for IT devices. So by, by encapsulating the uh, these part of the technology into a small, re easily replaceable device that makes you able to refresh the uh, technology and innovate um, without having to replace the entire unit. Uh, it provides optionality for the vendors so they can, uh, they don't have to anticipate what technologies will be the winners in the marketplace or something, as long as they have this standard port, uh, whoever seems to be the leading vendor or the leading technology at a time will be the module that's selected to be plugged in. And, and as I said, in addition to the, to the communication protocol, the module also supports, can support um, the higher level messaging protocols and such to provide uh, essentially a, a smart plug kind of capability. The way it actually works uh, is shown in this picture where on the right, we have the smart grid device, which is some sort of usually energy consuming uh, device, has the standard socket interface, either the large or small socket interface. 
uh, you plug the universal communication module in either the large or small form factors, the AC or DC as they're called, uh, into that. And then depending on what that module has built into it, it can speak in any number of protocols, um, both communication level and also at the messaging level. So that's the idea of it. Um, it's intended to uh, allow smart grid devices to be manufactured at a lower cost, add the smarts, if you will, to the, to the devices at a lower cost, and to keep that um, uh, flexibility that you would have uh, to deploy in any number of different uh, ecosystems. The basic end-to-end -end system would look something like this, where starting at the upper left, we'd have an open ADR VTN, rather like, uh, like, like um, Rolf was describing, uh, that's configured or operated by uh, some event scheduler, an operator at the utility usually. Uh, it does its usual open ADR sorts of things. And then uh, I've marked it as a Wi-Fi network, it could be the internet in general, communicates through some fashion, and I'll talk about the architectural options in a, in a little bit. Uh, communicates uh, and the communication ends up in uh, a one of these CTA 2045 modules, uh, which are provisioned and configured by the user to set rules and such if he wants to do that. And then because that module can be plugged into any number of different kinds of devices, um, the VTN, the open ADR communications can be translated to um, the, the, the uh, CTA 2045 commands uh, and we have an end to end demand response communication system. As I mentioned, uh, the CTA standard does have its own little set of, of, of messages or, or, or commands. Uh, they are similar to, but not identical to those for OpenADR. Uh, as Rolf mentioned, OpenADR mostly focuses on higher level informational uh, messages uh, regarding the grid status or, or, or requests for, for, for um, information, let's just say information that, that is sent regarding, let's say, price regimes such as, as a time of use tariff or, or specifically actual prices, which was some experiments we've been doing. Um, and that motivates presumably some kind of behavior. Typically, the intention is that the rules to respond to those kinds of, of signals are built into uh, the VEN, uh, if it's in open ADR, or perhaps in some gateway in, in some of the other configurations I'll show. So just to give some examples of how similar or dissimilar these are, um, they both have, uh, uh, we, can, we can imply uh, the simple protocol messages that, that Rolf mentioned uh, where we just have simple levels zero, one, two, and three. Um, those are potentially mapped to the CTA messages, which are load up, shed, critical peak event, or grid emergency. So they call them something different, but they, it has a similar kind of concept of four different levels, if you will. Uh, you can send, uh, for example, you can send a price uh, and the price can be passed all the way through if the device, if the appliance knows what to do with the price, that may be less likely in, in most situations and the translation uh, to some kind of a device activity would be more likely to occur um, before being sent to, uh, into, the, into the device uh, over the interface. So for example, there are other slight tweaks you have to make. For example, in OpenADR, an event has a start time and a duration. In CTA 2045, it has a start time and a stop time. So you'd have to make some kind of an adjustment to, to map one to the other. But it's not, it's not a big stretch because they were both built for similar, uh, to serve similar purposes. Um, the reason why this is feasible, and I'm not gonna get into too much technology here, but if we start, look at this picture on the left, the way this works is that the, uh, open ADR message comes in, uh, it's transmitted through some kind of communication network from the VTN in the first large box to the VEN, uh, like Rolf was describing. And, and that message is then intercepted or, or, or um, interpreted. It could be translated if there's some other uh, translation that, that's needed, or it can be interpreted into a set of device specific uh, on off signals or whatever is appropriate for the device. It actually can pass through the open ADR signal if, as in one of Rolf's cases, for example, if the appliance itself knows how to deal with open ADR directly. Uh, but typically it will be translated in some intermediary uh, function 
and then passed from the VIN through a local communication network, a LAN or, or Wi-Fi network in the, in the residence or something uh, to the UCM, the communication module that's then attached to the, the smart grid device. Deployments of these uh, typically look like this. Uh, there are a few examples here. So an open ADR VTN sends an open ADR signal into the internet. Uh, the most common, commonly implemented version of that today, uh, is, you may be familiar with, is, is what we call Venn in the cloud. This is typically what's done by thermostat manufacturers, for example. Uh, the uh, uh, Venn that intercepts the open ADR message exists in the cloud and usually in the manufacturer's cloud, a proprietary cloud. And then some kind of a signal is sent out. In this case, we're sending a CTA 2045 signal. It's often a proprietary one in today's methods. But in, in principle, it could just be a simple CTA 2045 message, which then is transmitted through some uh, local network to the module attached to the smart grid device and the functions occur. In the gateway model, which um, is, uh, of growing importance as, and we've heard in the earlier talks today, mentions of, of the home area or the, the home energy management systems or building energy management systems in some cases, the VEN can be resident there. So the open ADR signal goes from the VTN uh, source all the way to the VEN gateway, translated uh, or reinterpreted into a CTA message and then is forwarded to the smart grid device. This is the gateway architecture and is uh, Used, it's particularly used in, in commercial situations and it's of, of somewhat growing importance in the smart home kind of uh, theory for residential uh, work. And then finally, the, uh, the most uh, complex in some ways in terms of implementation is, is that the, uh, the VEN is actually in the plug itself, in the communication module. This has been shown, these have been built and tested uh, in uh, laboratory sort of settings, but have not seen uh, deployment that I'm aware of uh, in the uh, in the real world yet, but these are all just options for how you can take the open ADR uh, informational messages and convert them into um, more specific, more device specific uh, messages for your devices according to whatever rules you want to uh, you want to uh, install in the various translation uh, options. So that's the, that's the idea of how the two would work together. Um, and I will leave it not knowing exactly the uh, technical level of our, of, our, of our audience. And at the same time, uh, with the time constraints we have, I will leave it at that uh, and hope that that's been a, a useful instruction and may interest, uh, generate some interest in, in the CTA 2045 standard. Fantastic. Yeah, fantastic, Walt. And it was really fascinating to see those implementations. And um, I was I was struck by the observation that um, the the um, appliances have a lot longer life than a lot of I, ICT products. So there's kind of a mismatch there in what you're going to put into a certain device, isn't there? You know, you're thinking ahead. Um, OK, well, we've um, that's given us one kind of um, a perspective into the implementation of open open ADR and now we have another specifically looking at EV managed charging and we've got Stan Janssen here from Elad in uh, the Netherlands which is a knowledge and innovation center on smart charging uh, infrastructure yeah in uh, in Netherlands in in Europe yeah you're ready to go Stan uh, yes I am thank you Jonathan Fantastic. let me get my uh, slides up um... Oh, wait, let me do it another way. You should be able to see my slides now, is that correct? Yep, we're good. Thank you. We're good? good to go. Okay. Um, so, yes, uh, thank you so much for having me. It was a kind of a late, uh, I was kind of a late addition to today's agenda, but I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, my name is Ston Janssen and I will uh, this one will be light on technical details uh, to, to round off this, uh, this session. I will tell you a little bit about who uh, ELAD is and uh, what we've done and how uh, we are using OpenADR uh, going forward. So um, very briefly, ELAD started back before there were really any uh, electric vehicles on the road, but the, uh, a, um, 
a combination of the Dutch uh, distribution network operators decided that they wanted to kickstart the uh, electric vehicle uh, development in the Netherlands. So they decided to uh, create a foundation to develop and um, uh, and uh, place uh, thousands of charging stations uh, all throughout the Netherlands uh, just to solve that chicken and egg problem between electric vehicles and, uh, and charges. Um, so between 2010 and 2014, uh, we rolled out about, I believe, about 4,000 public charging stations in the Netherlands. And for years and years and years, that was the most charging stations in any country in the world, even though the Netherlands was such a small country. Um, and during that phase, uh, the there were no uh, commercially available charging stations. So ELAT actually worked together with a few um, uh, manufacturers of electrical equipment uh, to design the first charging stations. We were involved in uh, the uh, um, creation of the Menekes uh, plug for for electric vehicles, and uh, most mostly we were involved in all the communication protocols and the, the safety standards that are related to these charging stations. And then once uh, this process was kind of uh, standardized and uh, there were a few companies up and running uh, selling charging stations, uh, the government deemed that this was now, uh, uh, the market should now take over this, uh, this function and ELAT stopped uh, deploying new charging stations, but we, uh, uh, pivoted to innovating in the what we call the smart charging uh, space, which is where you adjust the charging speed depending on a, a situation on the electricity grid or the availability of renewables, everything we've talked about the day, uh, today. So um, just for those who don't know, uh, this is the Netherlands um, and there are a few uh, distribution network operators uh, of which the biggest are uh, Leander, Annexis, and uh, Steedin, and there are a few smaller ones out there, and they all contributed to uh, creating this ELAT foundation to be the, the pioneer in the electric vehicle space. Um, we have contributed uh, to some very popular open standards uh, that are that concern electric vehicles. Uh, a previous uh, episode of this. Uh, uh, series had um, uh, Robert de Leeuw on it, who uh, talked about the creation of OCPP, the Open Charge Point Protocol. I've seen it mentioned a few times uh, in some Q and A's and in some other uh, uh, slides today. Uh, it's really the worldwide standard for uh, charging stations to communicate with their back offices, uh, with their management platforms. Then there's the Open Charge Point interface. Again, the naming is a little. Uh, confusing maybe, but this is the, the standard that allows different operators of charging stations to talk to each other and different service providers where you can get your uh, your smart charging, your charging card or something, your payment option, and, and then you, that you can roam between the different uh, providers, uh, which is also quite popular. Of course, there are alternatives to that. And thirdly, we... Um, there was a mostly very small protocol called the Open Smart Charging Protocol, which was a, I call it a project-oriented pr uh, protocol. There was once a project and we needed a little protocol and someone designed something. And that's what we've been using for some of these smart charging uh, projects. And it's really that last one that is mostly in need of a serious overhaul and a serious um, successor. Um, because this one is a pretty narrow protocol, and that's that's where OpenADR comes in. Um, so, just a brief overview of what kind of projects we've been doing. ALAD is a very project-oriented organization where we take on a practical use case and we develop and design whatever uh, equipment or standards we need to implement that project. Um, so, in 2013, we started at Inexis with a uh, they had, I believe it was like 20 charging stations in their parking garage, and there was a, an effort to um, predict the available network capacity for, for the next 24 hours based on, on historic measurements and to send a profile to the um, uh, 
a charge point operator who could then make sure that the combined load of these charging stations would not exceed uh, whatever was given in that uh, in that profile. And that was done using OSC, the Open Smart Charging Protocol that I just talked about and OCPP between the operator and the charging station itself. Uh, then from 2016 onwards, uh, we had our first real commercial public um, smart charging uh, a pilot project in the Netherlands. Uh, actual normal people can sign up to be part of this. They can enter their uh, charging card number in an app and wherever they go charge, they receive a, uh, um, the uh, Jetlix organization receives their, that they've started charging and they can send a charging profile for that specific charging session. Now they were doing this based on a day ahead energy prices. They were working for an, uh, an energy company at that moment and this used a variant of OCPI 1.4, which had very preliminary uh, charging profile support. And again, OCPP from the um, from the uh, charge point operator to the charging station. Uh, then in 2017, we experimented with, uh, can we use electric vehicles for the frequency controlled reserve? So the, the primary spinning reserve to balance the national uh, electricity grid and um, this was using a variant of OCPI 2.0 where we like shoehorn some charging profile messages into it and again OCPP to the charging station. Um, and then in 2018 we did a very large project uh, where we had a thousand charging stations uh, virtually placed into, uh, into cities uh, to simulate a future uh, situation and um, then we would simulate a network capacity and then we would uh, control the in real time control the uh, the charging speeds using OCPP and, and those profiles were expressed in uh, what what would be the precursor to uh, the OSCP 2.0 protocol. And then in 2019, we started a public uh, smart charging project with 500 charging stations uh, and there was an actual a new energy contract between the, or at least a, a grid connection contract between the network operator and the charge point operator, where they would get more uh, capacity outside of the peak hours. They would, get, they, they would get three times 35 amperes outside of the peak hours. And during peak hours, their capacity limit would be reduced to, uh, well, it, it varied, but I believe it was like three times 10 amperes or something, which, um, uh, solved a lot of the congestion problems in those grids and was a nice experiment to see if this was a viable offer that we could make. Uh, and the uh, the actual the profiles with that, that dip in them, they were communicated using OSCP 1.0 and, and then again OSCP to the charging station. So lots of, there were others beside this, but these were the main ones. You can see a lot of exper experimentation going on. Uh, you learn a lot about what what doesn't work, um, cars that once uh, you have paused their charging will never wake up again and uh, never start charging again. All of those things, we contact the vehicle manufacturer. Often those things get solved with a software update or something, but there's all kinds of stuff that you figure out and you improve and, and the um, both the charging stations and the vehicles are much more robust because of uh, these pilot projects. Um, but then again, we, this was always using that communication between the network operator and these charge point operator was always an afterthought. It was always, well, we can maybe add a message to OCPI to do this, but it never felt quite right. And the OSCP was really running on its last legs. It was very limited in its scope and what you could do with it. So um, we were really looking for something else. So we we were really looking for what would be the open like smart charging standard to actually express all these all these different forms of smart charging that we want, because different projects had different takes on what smart charging smart charging is. Some wanted to do price differentiation, some wanted to do capacity profiles, uh, in some we use real time control to events like the the frequency reserve project, and others used more uh, prediction where you get a profile for the next 24 hours based on some historic uh, derivation. Um, different projects also had different 
routes to get to the to get this information to the vehicle to the charging session uh, most of them go through the charging station but some of them go through the vehicle manufacturer and then via their sim card in the car they go to the vehicle and again others they go through a home energy management system which can then speak like OCPP or some other proprietary protocol to the home charge wall box or something in the meantime the distribution network operators are exploring a future where demand side energy management is part of their of their core business and uh, not only in the context of electric vehicles but also uh, for heat pumps or heat pumps or or other electricity high power devices that that we might see in the future it's still early days and there's nothing has been settled yet but we're forward looking and alad is, is the organization that is, is doing these explorations for for the dutch network operators so just to re reflect ocpi really what you you it wants to be a roaming protocol it wants to allow someone with a card from company a to be able to charge at any charging station in any country and that's their core business uh, that's what that protocol is about and they're not uh, adding third parties to that adding the, the dno to that conversation always proved very difficult and the roaming part is at least and during those years they were not yet interested in offering smart charging services themselves so they were hesitant to incorporate any smart charging into the into that protocol which which i can understand and oscp was really too narrow in its scope it would and it would would have taken a great effort to to bring it to where we would like it to be to have all the feature written richness and expressiveness that that you would like in in, in one of these protocols then in 2019, we did an interesting project. It was called the Global Grid Integration Project, um, where we explored these different routes that I was talking about. And we used OpenADR as a protocol uh, to uh, communicate to a charge point operator, to a vehicle, a manufacturer, in this case Ford, and a consumer energy manager. We used uh, a few different commercially available ones who built a preliminary implementation of OpenADR into their, into their CEMs. And then you go uh, from that to uh, the charging stations uh, in, in our case. And I saw a, uh, a question already in, in the chat from Vinod Kotra. Um, if, if your charging station supports OCPP, how and and you receive a message in OpenADR. How do you how do you make that work? Well, the nice thing, uh, as Rolf explained, is that an event in OpenADR is really a um, like a schedule thing with which has intervals, uh, with a start time and and a certain value. And OCPP has something called a charging profile, uh, which is a message. It's it's called set charging profile, and it has basically the same structure. So. It's very easy to translate the event into a charging profile. And um, that's exactly what we did in these projects. Um, of course, you can also use the events with these simple ones where you can simply start and stop a charging session, uh, for instance, but the more complex where you actually draw a profile in time, you can easily translate those into uh, OCPP messages, but you need some piece of logic in between there to make that translation. Um, and really, this project gave us a first taste of OpenADR and how it could be used in this in these uh, situations. Um, uh, and it really seemed to check all the boxes from a technical standpoint. Um, I'll get to the what we perceive to be the strong points of OpenADR in a minute. Um, and during this project, we actually developed our own implementation of OpenADR, which is now open source. Um, so if anyone in the audience uh, is interested in getting started with OpenADR, and maybe if you're using Python, uh, then you should really check out this implementation. I, I think it's really good. I've worked on it myself. Um, and it's it gives you really uh, low effort entry into building OpenADR vents the clients or even VTNs, the servers. So it, it really lends itself well to experimentation or pilot projects or something. So uh, be sure to, to check that out. You can Google for Open Leader, which stands for Open Linux Energy ADR, because we're doing this with the Linux Foundation Energy. 
and then you'll you'll find us on GitHub or on openleader.org. Um, and we're actually doing a future pilot project uh, in collaboration with two with the two biggest DNOs, Eliander and Nexus, that, and we're looking into using OpenADR to communicate to these uh, consumer energy modules. Uh, but we're planning that, but I heard the, the BSI is a little bit ahead of us in, in that area. Um, so the strong points of uh, OpenADR, it's really that it's a, a, a mature specification with industry standard XML schema. It's really, um, I won't say it's not a lot of work, but at least it's it's doable work to make a compliant and functional uh, OpenADR implementation because of all of the good documentation and these uh, schemas that are available. It's backed by a mature organization with compliance certification and support. Again, if we wanted to develop OSCP further to fill this role, we would have to. You would have to set up an organization like that, and we're very thankful that there already is one. Um, Another thing is that it allows two-way communication, so the, the vents can send reports up to the DNOs and the, the, the network operator can send events down to the uh, consumers, um, which solves that problem. In a lot of our previous um, projects, we, we ran into this problem that OCPI was really a one-way protocol in some respects, or, and we're very glad that this is so strongly implemented in OpenADR. Um, it's very secure as well. There's the PKI infrastructure. You have transport level security with client side certificates. You have message signing. This, if this becomes part of the electricity infrastructure, that's critical infrastructure. So it needs to be secure. Um, another strong point is the flexibility of use cases. Again, I talked about the different kinds of smart charging that you might want to do, and we heard a few different ones today. Should we focus on pricing? Should we focus on direct control or uh, on, on optional participation in events? All of these things are, are very much possible because of the expressiveness of the OpenADR protocol and the expressiveness of, of what an event can be. Um, What's also great is that you can have different aggregation levels of the targets. So you, I can imagine that a fleet owner of, of rental cars or something would tar can target all cars that are currently in a certain geographic area, if so requested by the DNO. Um, or you can target a group of physical grid connections or, or whatever you want. You can target groups. It's, it's very flexible in that regard, so it makes it applicable to all, all kinds of situations. Uh, and again, the, the flexibility of signals with both pricing and capacity signaling or, or other things are supported. Um, so it's uh, it's still early days um, for, for us for this exploration, but OpenADR is looking very promising. And we have been a very happy, um, uh, we've been a very grateful user of the, of the protocol and all the, all the expertise that went into building it. So. Uh, uh, it, this is not intended to to be a commercial advert for OpenADR. This is an honest um, statement of, from from someone who has years of experience doing this kind of demand side management projects in the real world and seeing the advantages that OpenADR brings to it. And um, uh, that that was really what I wanted to tell you today. Um, if there's any specific questions, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. But uh, uh, with that, I will uh, turn it back to Jonathan. Thank you. Fantastic, Stan. Very good. <laughs> and it was, um, it's really fascinating to see, that, I mean, you just mentioned it, the wealth of experience that you've got in smart charging over the years. And then in that context, the implementation of OpenADR is fantastic. Um, yes. Okay, we, we've gone a little bit over, but that's totally fine. Uh, because it's been absolutely fascinating and really interesting. Um, but we have just now half an hour or so available for some uh, questions. Uh, but uh, well, I'll also take this opportunity to ask uh, Ben uh, from Carbon Co-op and also um, uh, Nina uh, from Bears to come back uh, and field questions. Um, so And also Rolf and, <coughs> and Walt, hopefully on the line still as well. Um, and Ben, hopefully, will be keeping an eye on the Q&A if people want to 
um, ask questions to any of the panelists. Uh, but first, Rolf, um, just one thing to pick up with you. And um, uh, you did mention, obviously, most of the examples of implementation being in the United States and, and a few others from, from other parts of the world. Um, particularly thinking about a European context, what kind of liaison have you been doing with European organisations, regulators, uh, and what have you? Um, uh, because I think we're all really interested to see more more uh, work around open ADR in, in the in Europe. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, uh, Jonathan. A really great question. Uh, I, I wish I had the hundred percent of the answer, but uh, I'll, I'll give you what uh, what I know. Um, so, looking a little bit outside of the United States, I think one of the first countries, um, and we're getting to Europe in a second. Uh, one of the first countries that really embraced open ADR was Japan. And um, as you, or as, as folks certainly remember, we had the, uh, the Fukushima um, disaster. Um, oh, by now, oh, time flies, right? Is it already 10 years ago or something like that? Uh, something in, in, that, in that range. And after that, um, TEPCO and METI in Japan really pushed hard on demand side management in order to to really compensate for you know these issues that they had after uh, after this uh, earthquake and tsunami where, where there was just simply not enough power available right so so they pushed really hard on on getting uh, these these systems connected and uh, it was i think just the right time because we were talking to them before about open adr and uh, so they basically implemented open ADR and in certain areas uh, of TEPCO, um, they mandated open ADR uh, at least to an aggregator level. And uh, ever since they have also been experimenting um, with um, open ADR further down all the way to like an inverter and things like that. So uh, hopefully, in fact, we hear in the next quarter a little bit more about uh, Japan again because we are planning a a workshop there. Uh, we we wanted to go there, but obviously at the current time uh, <laughs> uh, that didn't quite work. So maybe next year we we can uh, be there again and, and talk about it. So that that was one of the first countries there. Uh, Korea uh, has also been uh, looking at it, and then um, uh, Transpower in New Zealand uh, last year implemented their first open ADR based. A demand response project as well and uh, Australia is, is looking at it is also so mm. you know quite a bit quite a bit of stuff happening there and and then swinging over to Europe um, I, I have to say that for quite a while and correct me when I'm wrong but I think while Europe has always been kind of cutting edge on technology I think they were still a little bit behind on, on demand response flexibility. And, and my personal uh, feeling is that this is in particular because of privacy, right? Privacy regulation, things like that. As far as I know, uh, smart meters, for instance, in Germany really only started to be installed just a few years ago until they, when they figured out, you know, the, the secure gateway <laughs> that needed to be in each meter and things like that. So I think there were some of these um, uh, topics that sort of hindered the, the progress a little bit, even though the technology was there. But that being said, um, I think really um, the the further proliferation of EV charging, I think, has really changed the, the trajectory there. You know, in particular, as, as I briefly mentioned in my presentation, um, we, we were talking to a number of German municipal utilities that all are, you know, uh, <laughs> really um, now getting to the point where they say, okay, we must do some kind of demand side management because of all these charge stations, you know, they're, they're popping up more and more. And, you know, Germany has already a problem with, but with almost too much solar at times and things like that. Right. So, so it becomes more and more complicated to, to regulate the, uh, the grid. And, um, so we, we have heard of a number of interesting projects coming 
for instance, um, out of Europe. I mean, we heard earlier, of course, from uh, Carbon Co-op, um, then ELAD, we just heard about their projects. There's the Elbe project in Hamburg. Uh, Wattenfall, Eastern Germany has, uh, has uh, OpenADR now uh, implemented, or at least on, on, in trials. I'm not sure how far they are. Again, Hamburg, you know, Parkstrom. And then we are seeing also some of the energy companies like Shell, uh, and total um, being being really uh, interested in adding this flexibility there. So it's it's really mm. coming now. And in fact, I think the last I would say two years, um, like a large percentage of our new member companies are actually in the the EV charging space. So um, to, to the extent that we even started like an interest group for, <laughs> for EV charging mm. and, you know, we're just getting this, this off the ground. And uh, I believe Stan briefly mentioned it. Um, you know, there's also cooperation with EE bus <coughs> where, and I believe there's a question about uh, EE bus versus open ADR as well here in the, in the Q and A. So we, we are looking at working together with EE bus to define, you know, some overarching architectures here. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't necessarily see them as competition. Uh, and I have to admit, though, that I'm not for sure an expert for the EE bus technology, but they are a very good complement to us because they can control you know, buildings, they could control local networks and things like that, right? So the, the, the architecture that we have seen a few times today, open ADR to some kind of a gateway or controller or cloud-based endpoint would really lend itself really well to that, you know, to continue with EE bus or OCPP, or, you know, any other building control technologies, Lonmark, Bucknet, you know, what, what have you. And, you know, of course there, there is, you know, there, there could be some, you know, parallel, uh, uh, you know, information flow here with EE bus signals coming from, from higher up in the chain. So there's certainly this possibility. And I wouldn't necessarily say one is better than the other. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's really more about how you want to implement it. And coming back to what we have mentioned a few times that open ADR really is there to inform and motivate. So mm -hmm. what it, what, what that really means for me, and I think what a lot of utilities here like, is that this automatically provides some kind of a demarcation point, yep. right? So if, if equipment is owned by the consumer or by a company or, you know, whoever it is, they might not really want the utility to directly fiddle with it, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, you don't, you don't want, you know, the lights being turned off here behind you where, where you're sitting, right? With, without your building management system having some, uh, you know, insights and some, some you know, added uh, ideas, you know, maybe they say, well, no, these lights need to stay on, right? But there's a warehouse that is empty. So there we can turn off the lights. So again, you know, giving the consumers as well as the manufacturers of these control systems the, the, the power, so to speak, of how they react. I think that's really one of the critical factors to, to bring the customers on board with this and not just yeah. shoving something down their throat, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you need to do that. And then, then also, of course, now we're looking at, um, I briefly mentioned it uh, in my slides, at more local standardization through Senelec, Sen in, in Europe and uh, potentially some uh, some country specific groups as well. Yeah, cool. Yeah, uh, Carbon Co-op, we were involved in a, a H2020 project, Horizon 2020 project, looking at smart meters across the EU 2015 to 2018. And it was definitely, I think, has been a cause of some of the lag in, in thinking about these other standards because just getting the smart meters out there and uh, a common kind of approach. Um, okay, Walt, I had a question uh, which is about um, CTA 2045, it seems one of the crucial things in its success is the mandating by the states and utilities and what, what, um, 
what to what extent are utilities involved in kind of specifying standards and pushing performance standards um, for technology providers? Well, I'm not about uh, performance standards, uh, the uh, because uh, that's not really a performance issue per se, uh, I don't think. But uh, utilities have been very active in the piloting and testing of of uh, adoption of these kinds of technology, CTA in particular. Um, and as you say, uh, they are making their way into grid codes in certain jurisdictions. There was a, a in the last revision of the California uh, building codes uh, a couple of years ago, a year year or two ago, uh, there was a, a significant push made at the last minute to try to get CTA actually specified in the uh, water heater uh, domain. Uh, that wasn't um, that has been. I think that's been passed on into the next revision. They're revised every three years, so I think we can expect to see something there. Uh, there are also um, certain energy associations in in regional associations uh, in the northeast or sorry, northwest and northeast for that matter who have who have um, taken up uh, the cause of trying to push these things forward i don't know that utilities themselves uh individually other than, than exploring the technology i have all that much um i haven't seen, I, I don't know about all that much push if you will uh to see to make this happen uh, their focus, I think, has has historically been on, on larger, uh, larger returns, if you will. Until you get a large aggregation of residential devices, you don't, you can't compete with a commercial uh, demand response, uh, you know, resource. Um, there are vendors, though, who are trying to to uh, connect the dots, if you will, uh, who make some of these modules, but at the same time are trying to. to run aggregations of significant numbers of let's say water heaters as a even for regulation service or, or uh, uh, so so for very rapid response kind of demand response by switching off a, a very large fleet of these devices so if you can get to scale using a technology like the cta sort of thing you can actually start to have some some influence but i think it's still a bit of an uphill battle in most in most areas that, that i'm familiar with mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. And Stan, um, in terms of the um, EV charger um, use cases, I mean, um, grid operators are interested in different use cases to achieve different ends. So home charging, street commercial, workplace charging, fleet management, vehicle to grid, you know, all these different kind of use cases. Are some of these uh, easier for you to achieve in terms of meeting these kind of flexibility goals? Are some of them, some of them harder? Um, well, uh, m uh, of course, so, some are easier than others. Mm -hmm. uh, all of them are still, um, you know, legally a bit murky because at the moment there are there is no such thing as the the network operator having anything to say about what happens behind a uh, a grid connection. The grid mm -hmm. connections are a standard product with a uh, fixed capacity uh, that you pay for and that's it and you should be able to use it however you'd like uh, however with the, the the change of the um the way those connections will be used uh, if, if you charge a car at home that's a very different thing than uh cooking on an electric uh, uh stovetop or, or running your washing machine those are pretty short peak loads uh, intermittent uh, while a car can be hours and hours of five kilowatts, 10 kilowatts, uh, which is not what the um, electricity grids were originally designed for, even though your grid connection has that capacity technically and contractually. So um, apart from the technology that we need in where open ADR in my uh, view is a very uh, competent option, mm. there's also a lot of still um, legal work and um, you know, uh, rules and regulations yeah. that need changing sometime, but that's a slow process. You want to, you want to get those right. You don't, like Rolf said, you, you don't want, um, to, um, create the impression that you are reaching into people's homes and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and turning off their telly for them, uh, whenever the, the, the big bad, the grid operator thinks it's time or, or whatever, you know, you, mm -hmm. you want to do this in a, 
collaborative way with their um, with with your customers. And the, the first thing I would think is an informational aspect, like like Rolf said, it, uh, open data can be very useful for an informational aspect. Maybe that's a first step where you can just let people know, like this might not be a great time to charge your car. So if you can do it at a different time, please do so. Um, or you give them like a forecast, like a, we had a project where people had made uh, like a weather forecast for charging for the electricity grid. Mm. Um, uh, something like that, that could be a friendly first step, I think. And that's where many of these technologies could play a part. So that would just be an informational broadcast and then people would uh, opt into maybe automating that that uh, or, or not. Um, your, your question regarding vehicle to grid is, uh, in my mm. opinion, still the the most difficult one because yeah. now you're now you're actually um, um, de discharging or something from a vehicle, which makes people very uneasy. Uh, of course, m much of these problems will get solved when uh, the higher capacity and larger range electric vehicles become more mainstream. But I remember, especially in those first years, EV drivers would always 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 wherever they got they would charge they would plug in their car and they would always want to be full because you only had like 60 miles or 100 miles of, of energy in, in your in your battery now nowadays those problems are, are alleviated a bit but um so it's a very multifaceted problem it's definitely not just a technology i think the technology is ahead of um the um the regulatory and societal uh, acceptance of this, and as as it should be, yeah. and we uh, that that uh, that is to me that is the um, the great challenge in this, yeah. getting people to in a friendly way, in a cooperative way, to get them on board. Mm, mm, uh, mm, mm. As all, I always say, the at least in in the Netherlands, the the electricity grids are publicly owned. The distribution network operators are public companies, the, the municipalities and provinces are the shareholders of these companies. So they really are our grids. They're, they're from all of us. So we all want to make them work as efficiently and as cost effectively as possible. Um, so I can think we can have a very, we should have, we look should look for a friendly relationship with our customers um, mm. because they are part owners of this grid. It's a very good point with all this this technical innovation is like involving engaging citizens and users in that definitely um nina hopefully you're still with us um and i and i wanted to give you an opportunity to comment on any of the open adr stuff that we've been talking about but but also to think about once Paz um 1878 is complete whether you foresee any further rules needed to improve flexibility here in the uk yeah so i think Definitely really interesting to see uh, the discussions here. And yeah, technology in many ways um, is leading the way. But I think there's a lot of really good work happening both in the UK and abroad to develop that societal engagement and also to make sure regulation can be agile to make sure, essentially, as, as has been said, society is getting those benefits. Um, so certainly in the UK, there's a lot of work going on. In particular, I'd, I'd point you to the Smart Systems and Flexibility Plan which sets out very specific actions the government and industry and Ofgem, the regulator here in the UK, are all taking together to kind of make sure that all those different pieces of the puzzle do come together at the end. Um, because the UK now has a legally binding target for net zero emissions, and uh, you don't get all the way to targets like that with part, part of the puzzle. You have to have the whole, the whole puzzle there. And so I think we're looking quite broadly across the board at yeah, consumer engagement, regulation, markets for flexibility, and how those pieces all need to come together with that underlying technology that delivers these things. Um, and yeah, the data and digitalization to connect all these bits together. Um, and you'll see in my presentation, I spoke quite a lot about how consumer preferences were respected in this technical framework. Um, and I think that's because, as everyone's been saying, this is clearly key once you start working at the, the domestic level, having people uh, engaged and involved and, and satisfied that this potentially automated systems are doing their bidding. Um, I think that's that's quite important. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of pieces of the puzzle and I think we're, we're aware of that and we're pushing on all of those fronts and hopefully it all comes together for everyone. 
Great. Yeah. And Ben, um, I, I guess picking up the points that Stan and Nina have made, um, how are end users and, and households involved in the PowerShaper project? Um, and where do you see the project going in terms of like augmenting uh, new use cases and features and what have you and involving users in that? Um, hi, sorry, can you hear me just to check? Yeah, 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 yeah you're yeah. good. Sorry, it's got on my laptop. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting to try to um, plot out where, where, think about where it's going to go next. I mean, in the time that we've spent building the system, so it started back in, well, 2019, early 2019, um, I mean, of course, in the UK, we've seen a huge surge in interest in uh, dynamic time of use tariffs. And so alongside the uh, interest that people have, which has already been noted in these explicit DSR schemes, we also feel that we do need to cater to um, the interest that um, uh, all our members, our participants have uh, many of them in the in things like the octopus agile tariffs. So I think one of the key things we're looking at adding to our system is um, you know, integrating those capabilities together and and rationalising them as well because they they of course they won't always be aligned with each other. So um, this is partly an answer in some ways to one of the questions that was asked. Um, you know the, what the supplier wants, and as as is reflected in the grid tariff that the consumer receives, is is not always the same as what the DNO wants, or indeed what we as an aggregator may want. So there there are different um, competing interests here, and we have to have find some way of rationalising all of these, um, and that can either be um, through uh, marking mechanisms, or it can be through coordination or cooperation. But that's um, one of the things that really needs to now be looked at going forward, is taking all these separate uh, value streams and, and looking at them together as a single, in a single system. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, I feel like we've covered so much on this webinar, being through all the different aspects uh, and uh, and um, bits of this problem. Um, so we're, we're wrapping up now. I don't know if anyone, any of the panelists have got any closing remarks you want to make or any observations before we close there. Okay, well, it, it's been, as I say, it's been an absolutely fascinating webinar. Um, ben, I don't know, did you want to round things off? Um, uh, is uh, some thanks to be made and what have you? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd like to thank all of um, our panelists um, for um, for contributing today and sticking sticking with it for the whole afternoon. Um, it's also been quite a long webinar, um, so thanks for that. And um, uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm sure that I can also pass on the thanks from. Uh, Newcastle University and the Turing Institute um, for um, to all the attendees today. Yeah, and then thanks for Rolf and Walt for getting up uh, somewhat early, <laughs> um, all, all over over there in uh, California. Okay, thank you very much, and yeah, we'll end it there. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much for hosting. Thank you.